just a little aluminium bar with a peel away sticky bit at the back. So you literally just peel that off okay. and you just stick it onto the bridge of the nose. And when you put it on, you get a much better seal on it. Okay. But it still steams a little bit. Okay. So you can get a better seal. Hi there, uh, my name is Louise Shepherd. I'm the CEO of um, Alder Hay Children's NHS Foundation Trust. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to our stage here at the Giant Health Tech event. It's a real honour and privilege to be joining you today from, from our innovation hub here at Alder Hay, which has been with us for about five years now and has been a crucial part of our journey as one of the leading healthcare providers for children and young people, not just in the UK, but um, across the world. Our vision is to um, de deliver a healthier future for children and young people. Um, and, and we recognise that to do that, we have got to be absolutely at the forefront of all the latest developments in terms of healthcare and providing a really important service uh, for children and young people to enable them to solve the problems that they face every day, uh, not just here in the UK, but around the world. We're passionately committed to that. We've got fantastic clinicians who've worked collaboratively for years now with industry and with academic partners to enable those innovations to happen. And we're, we're absolutely committed to being working collaboratively with everybody across the world in this endeavour. So today we wanted to share with you the journey that we've been on, um, why this is so important for us, but crucially for children and young people, the many problems that they face, as I say, not just here in the UK, but around the world. And, and we want to share some of that learning with you and learn from you too about how we can make this even better for the future. So thanks again for joining us. Really looking forward to having you with us today uh, and going on this journey together. Hiya, my name's Ian Hennessy. I'm a consultant surgeon at Aldehy and I'm also the clinical director of innovation. And I just want to try and get across to you, not just why a hospital would want to do this, not just why the chief executive wants to do this, but actually, why do clinicians want to innovate? What's the driving force behind it? What's the thing which pushes us along? Because obviously we know we, we have a busy day job. Uh, so I'm going to use my story and my thoughts um, on, on why it's so important for clinicians to innovate. So my, my job, uh, to give you a bit of background about me, um, is, so I'm a paediatric surgeon. I operate on this bit. That's me in an operating theatre. They're actually testing a bit of kit out. Um, and I operate on, you know, big kids, well kids like Ted here, and I operate on some really, really unwell children, and tiny babies. I think the smallest I ever uh, operated on is about 400 grams, so it's, you, know, you can fit that type of baby inside your, inside your hands. There's an incredible diversity of what we do, and technology is a very key part of how we deliver care. But the other half of my job, um, is I'm the director of innovation. Um, my job is to go out finding the newest and latest technology and try and apply it into healthcare. And this is me um, with the latest type of operating microscope, um, which has a 40 times optical zoom and actually has got 3D. I can put um, 3D glasses on and it will, uh, it will recreate it in 3D. And I'm, I'm operating on a custom printed um, operative model there. Um, which has been 3D printed out um, and with uh, tissues to mimic what real uh, children's tissues are like. Now, I'm going to use this picture here um, to get across to you why I spend half of my time doing that technology piece. Why is it that, you know, because it's an important job uh, being a paediatric surgeon, I really enjoy doing it, but why do I spend 50% of my time um, working on technology. So this here is a is a painting by a, a, a Liverpool native called uh, Pulas, who who lived at the end of the nineteenth century, and at the time, fifty percent of children wouldn't see their tenth birthday, fifty percent child mortality, 
and uh, he had a child die at the age of one from tuberculosis. Um, and he painted this painting in, in response to that. It's called The Doctor, it's an incredibly famous painting. Um, and people, when they look at this painting, they see lots of different things. Um, some people see the, the good and caring doctor, who's clearly been there all night, you know, concentrating and doing everything he can to save the child. Other uh, people see the, you know, the, the beautiful child in the centre, um, you know, clearly gravely unwell. Other people's eyes are drawn to the parents in the background, um, the emotionally shredded mum with her head in her hands on the table and, and, the, and the dad there. And that, that look on the dad's face, that's not changed. Uh, I don't care what you do, pal, but just get on and do it. And I think I see something personally different when I look at this painting. He's just doing it all wrong. Her uh, airway is in the incorrect position. She's got no oxygen on. She's got no intravenous fluids running. She's probably got back to an infection, not being given any antibiotics. So IV keftraxone will probably be good. No oxygen saturation monitoring, no point of care testing. Um, you know, not the right sort of bed, so chair for goodness sake. He's got unlabeled medications there. It's not bearable with the elbow. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. If I could, you know, get a backpack, went into the hospital, filled it with kit, got in a time machine, jumped back, came out here, I could fix this. He doesn't stand a chance. He's got no chance at all, but I could jump in there, fix that, like that, right drain by tomorrow. I mean, I've not even thought of antibiotics there yet. Um, I'd be like a magician. You know, how could you possibly uh, have, have fixed that? And, and what knocks me out is I'd love to have a chat to this doctor. Because um, imagine the questions that you come back and say, you know, how do you do this? How do you fix this? How do you cure this? Um, I'd love it when they would ask them the smallpox. How do you treat the smallpox? Well, we don't have to. You know, we, we've destroyed it. You know, we eradicated it from the planet. But what really frustrates me is that, you know, let's jump forward to today. Uh, let's imagine we have a, you know, a, a gravely unwell child with a, you know, a stage four uh, tumour that's got poor cytogenetic profile and, you know, we throw everything at it and it doesn't work. And, you know, you just feel so futile. And you know, you know that we will figure this out that in a hundred years time. There will be a doctor, a smug doctor, standing there going, well, that's right, you know, that's easy, you know, just uh, uh, get a meta ion infuser, be right as rain by tomorrow. And for me, what drives me, you know, what drives me, the innovation at all day is that we, we can't wait that long. You know, we must be faster, we must accelerate towards it. So I'm going to give you another story about the power of technology and how it is, you know, in many ways, magical. I'm going to speak about Leah. Now, Leah, um, this is Leah. This is Leah the day before her diagnosis. Um, and unfortunately, Leah, Leah had a terrible tumour. Uh, this is huge. The white bit is the tumour. The black bit is the rest of the child. Um, in her abdomen, huge, enormous. And um, it had been assessed by national panels and didn't think we could get it out. We thought we we're going to have to palliate this child. We're, gonna, you know, we're not going to be able to, to, to treat this tumour. Um, and her dad had worked at Aldehy and he came to us and he said, look, could you get this tumour out? You know, would you be able to, to excise it? Um, now, these are two of our, our top oncology surgeons, cancer surgeons, Joe and Fiona. Um, they weren't sure. And they came down to our innovation hub, and this is where we do all the tech development. It's where you saw the great big microscope and all the rest of it. And this is where I'm standing in the prototyping part of it. I said, look, could you print, we knew how to print it out complex things. Could you print out this tumour so that we can get a better idea of whether or not we can take it out or not? So we did that in partnership with 3D Life Prints, who are embedded 3D print hub, and we printed this tumour out. Now, the white bits are our hip bones. Um, the red bits are really important vascular supply. The yellow bit is the tumour. Um, and what was so fascinating was they started building this case. They started building this team to take the tumour out. Could we do it? Because it also had this 
so I'm hearing a lot about urologists, we're looking at the ureters, which is what connects the kidney to the bladder, went right through the centre of it as well. It's like, how are we, you know, how can we get this out? And Joe Fiona, they built a team, they built a consensus um, of people that are going, yes, this is reasonable. We can take this out. And the day of the operation, again, you know, using a bit of sci-fi, it felt like the X-Wing fighters taken off. Uh, to go and do Battle of the Death Star because of that. You know, they actually closed the locked doors to stop people from sticking their heads in and out, asking all the time, you know, how's it going, how's it going, so not to be um, put off by it. And after a, you know, very long time, uh, not only had they you know, got most of the tumour out, they got 95% of it out, um, but she was still incredibly unwell, incredibly unwell, sort of straight after the operation still requiring um, uh, chemotherapy and all the drugs and to get over the actual operation itself. But she just did spectacularly well. Um, so from that little girl, you had that massive tumour inside her abdomen, which, you know, if taking that tumour out, they could have cut off the blood supply to her legs, they could have done all sorts of things, but they managed to get all the tumour out, 95% of it, um, and this is her, six weeks later, going back to school. And this is her and her family uh, ringing the cancer bell at the end of, uh, end of treatment. Look at this telly down here, Leah. This is, um, this is a picture of, of you ringing the bell in the hospital, which people get to ring uh, when you finish your treatment. I know you'd heard that bell being rung by lots of other people, so can you tell us what that was like to, to ring the bell in the hospital? It, um, it was like... It was like the um, it was one, like the best day um, of my life because um, I was there with some of my family and they were well they were standing there with me and I, what I've been through I think my family would have appreciated. It. So what was? What was the worst day of our lives was immediately became the best day of our lives. And Joe and, and, and one of the other surgeons, Fiona, came up to see me and my wife uh, on the ward. Um, I think it's fair to say there was a few tears, wasn't there? <laughs> there was, uh, yeah, and a big hug, just, biggest hug. <clears throat> you said it before, Dan, it feels like yeah. a miracle. It just mm. feels like a miracle. We're so blessed to be able to sit here and, and, and tell Leah's story. Um, the, the, the three reasons we want to tell Leah's story. We want to, you know, we want to give credit to these guys. You know, but without them coming into our lives, Leah probably wouldn't be, be sat here yeah. now. Um, and we want to give hope to other people who maybe find themselves in, in a similar situation um, now or in the future. You know, you know, miracles can miracles can happen, mm -hmm. and, and never never give up on that. So I'm sure they agree. That is a pretty good reason why. We need to innovate, why we need to push the boundaries, why we need to achieve these things which beforehand would have been regarded as magic, you know, the classic Arthur C. Clarkism, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's what we want to happen at Old Hay. We want the children to get better as if by magic. Now, that was a powerful story, but innovation doesn't always have to be life or death. Sometimes it's the little things which make an enormous difference. And I'm going to hand on now to one of our superstars of the hospital, uh, Lewis, and a project which he recently he challenged us with. And one of our innovation consultants, Jack, took up that challenge. So I'm now going to hand over to them as to why it's so important uh, from a patient and parental point of view. Hi, my name's Jack Morton and I'm an innovation consultant here at Alderhey Children's Hospital. This morning you're going to hear from a lot of my colleagues about the amazing work we are able to do to help the children and their families that come through our door. I was privileged and humbled to work in collaboration with Endura to help one of our young ambassadors, Lewis, get the cycling gloves that he deservedly wanted. But instead of me telling you about his story, I will let him and his family tell you. Hi, my name is Lewis and I'm seven years old. Hi Lewis, um, why did you want some gloves? Because um, on my bike, the handles hurt, my um, hands hurt. 
And your hands hurt? Yeah. And why do they hurt? Because of the handles. Okay. And why, did, why could you not wear normal gloves, Lewis? Because of four fingers. Oh, and what about your other hand? And why have you got four fingers? Why is that? Because I have a person do. Okay. And have you had any operations on your hands? Yes. How many? Sixteen. Sixteen on your hands or in total? In total. Okay. Can you remember having operations on your hands? What did they do? Then put a bandage on. Yeah. And then made some, made me some fingers. Okay. So, we needed some gloves. So what did we do? Can you remember what we did? Who did we write to? Alder Hay. Me and my wife contacted Alder Hay Innovation Centre um, to ask if there was anything help that they can give to Lewis. We just wanted Lewis to be like everybody else and have a pair of gloves that fitted him. Um, over several years we've been buying gloves and having to stitch a finger up or cut a finger off uh, of the gloves themselves. So it was really important that Lewis felt just like one of his peers. So when he was cycling on his push bike, when we were teaching him to cycle, we used to have to put masking tape on the handlebars because uh, the way Lewis's hands couldn't grip the handle as well. And they would really hurt him in several areas. Um, so when uh, Old Day came back to us and said, look, we're looking at it as a project, uh, we felt some real hope uh, and we put everything towards that way to help them. So then, Lewis, um, when, you, when you wrote to Jack and Ian at Alder here, you asked for some new gloves. Um, can you remember what happened then? You sent a photo. You sent some photos? On my hands. You sent your photo of some hands? Okay, and then what did we do here? What's this? We measure my hands. You measure your hands? Okay. Put that down. So we measured your hands. Put your hands in them now. Turn it around. So. So, what did we do? Can you remember what Daddy did? Dad draw them around. Dad draw them around. And then what did we do with this piece of paper? What did we do with it? We measured my hands. Measured your hands. And did we send it to somebody? Yes. Who did we send it to? Can you remember? Jack and Stephanie. Jack and Stephanie. Now, Stephanie works at Enjora. Yeah, and Enjora make gloves. So we had lots of information backwards and forwards, didn't we? Lots of emails. Uh, and then Stephanie from Enjora got in touch. Um, and after lots of emails, we came back with a, a pair of gloves, which uh, made my wife and I uh, overwhelmed with joy that all we wanted to be was Lewis, just to be one of the crowd. So he got his first pair of gloves and absolutely loved them. And then, unbeknown, we then got another pair sent, which uh, Lewis likes to use as his goalkeeping gloves. Uh, so we can't thank Alder Hay or Endura enough. Uh, they've been absolutely brilliant. They listened to everything we asked for, uh, and nothing was too much of a trouble. Um, we're really supportive, um, and we put the, the faith of what we could give to our son in their hands. Many thanks. If it's and to Alder Hay and Endura. Hi there, and welcome to the, the Hacks workshop, basically. Um, this is our rapid prototyping centre at Old H. Owens Hospital. It's not particularly fancy, I'll be honest. It's basically just some worktops, some hand tools, some drawing boards, some things just to kind of uh, get your creative crafting uh, juices going. Uh, but essentially, it's like a solution centre. You've got an idea, you've got a problem, you come down here, you've got some members of staff, we'll just sit here and try to work things out. Um, and I thought I'd just kind of go through some of the simpler things we did. You know, not necessarily the you know the big AI projects or data projects, but the simple hacks and tricks which we used um, to solve the problems which were getting thrown at us every single day while we were in the hospital. Now, um, I'm pretty sure 
everyone else will have been uh, plagued by the problems of having your glasses fog up. Um, this is actually something we spent a lot of time on in our rapid prototyping centre trying to fix. So, straightforward mask, one of the terrible ear loops. Problem is, you don't get a very good fit with the, the wire that comes with a lot of the masks, so that when you put your glasses on, lo and behold, they steam up so you can't see a thing. Now, there are many ways around this. Uh, one way is to get a better fit across the nose. A really cheap way of doing this is you can actually buy extra nose bridges um, for this. So this is just a little aluminium bar with a peel away sticky bit at the back. So you literally just peel that off okay. and you just stick it onto the bridge of the nose. And when you put it on, you get a much better seal on it. Okay. But it still steams a little bit. Okay. So you can get a better seal. And the way to get a better seal, and this is the ultimate way, and you know, this is actually not a new thing because as surgeons, uh, you know, we have problems with masks fogging up our safety glasses all the time. So we would just put a bit of tape across our nose, but that looks a bit weird. Um, so we've found is you can actually get double-sided uh, sticky tape, which is designed to work on skin. And I think uh, the official name is maybe lingerie tape. Uh -huh. So just get a section of that. Uh -huh. Stick it onto the back of the mask. That's where the nose bridge goes. See there? Yeah. And the difficult bit, just peel that part off. And then, close your eyes when you're doing this. You can stick it on your face and you've got a complete seal now, right the way across here. So that when you put your things on, doesn't matter what you do, you will not be able to steam up your glasses because you have uh, sealed off it, sealed it off completely. Okay, that works well. The other advantage to this is that uh, take the ears off. You can eat <laughs> with it with it on, and it stops people from taking their mask on and off and messing with it because once it's on, it's on. The only problem is obviously is when you take it off, you know, it is a bit sticky. Um, so that's a thing you can do. Now, another area that we looked at was um, anti-fog. Uh, how can you stop your glasses from fogging up? Um, now, we actually found that snowboarders have got this sorted and that they have special sprays which you can get, which you can spray onto the back of of, uh, of the glasses. You know, if you do maybe once or twice a, a week uh, just to treat your glasses there. Just do it on the inside, and then that, if I just put this on upside down so that you can see there's, see, so it doesn't really steam up as well either. So those are some simple hacks and tricks from stopping yourself from getting steamed up glasses, which actually was a big problem because if people aren't wearing their eyewear and they're in contact with someone, and they've been doing this classic thing that people do is they wear their eyewear on their top of their head because of steaming. Then that means they have to self-isolate for two weeks. Whereas if they'd had their glasses down, then they don't because they're wearing the appropriate PPE. So, you know, simple, simple tricks, but potentially it could have a large effect. We've got hundreds of them from, you know, how to... Uh, make isolation hoods not exhaust out the front and we could go on all day but simple simple hacks it doesn't have to be complicated you don't have to have an artificial intelligence platform you can have quite a big impact in a hospital just by doing a little simple uh, simple workaround so I would, I would thoroughly encourage um, this type of solution center in any hospital because you know it's not just during the COVID crisis that we have problems we have problems all the time and a lot of them could actually be solved in quite a simple way.
Hi, my name is uh, Chun Kwok. Uh, I'm one of the specialist uh, registrars training in pediatric surgery. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the Handover app, which uh, I've developed uh, with Mr. Partridge in the pediatric surgery team. Uh, the Handover app is an app where we wanted to create something that uh, we could access as a team. So we used to have a paper handover like this and we wanted to go to something like this. And the, there were two reasons why we wanted to do this, uh, uh, make this app. And one was just the amount of printing that we needed to do. So each morning we would go into handover and there would be 15 of us, we needed to print 15 pieces of paper. And uh, we would hand over maybe at 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. So that would mean more printing. And it wasn't just the printing, it was the coordination. You, you had to coordinate who update, updated the uh, Excel spreadsheet. So once somebody had it open, you, you couldn't access it. So it was, we needed an easier way, a more dynamic way of updating the handover list, basically. The second reason was uh, that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic just spurred us on and pushed us to make this app on the phone, which you could wipe down because it's the most sort of frequently accessed thing that I would put in my pocket and on a piece of paper, you just couldn't wipe it down. So we had to have something on the phone uh, where you could wipe it down and access it in a safe way. So, so what did we do? Uh, well, we developed an app where you could access all the patients uh, of the day. You could uh, update it in a dynamic manner. You could um, share the information with the team. You can basically see all the new admissions. You can see all the patients who are listed for emergency theatre. Um, and it was really fortunate that we already had the platform in place at Alderhey, which allowed us to do this. Um, even somebody like me with uh, very little programming uh, experience, I could use the, the Power Apps platform and develop uh, the app in the way where which we wanted it. So I could visually develop the front end of the app that uh, met our requirements. Um, and the Power Apps platform provided the back end, which was secure. Um, so that met the information uh, governance uh, criteria that we had. What really made a big difference was the way that the app was visually very similar to the previous handover that we had. So there wasn't much of a mental uh, jump or transition into using the app. Um, we even had a mode on the app that was essentially this looked exactly the same as the old uh, paper list and that made it easier for people to just jump into using the app. Um, I think the other thing that really helped was the fact that even a user of the app myself, I could make changes to the app in a quick way so the development cycle was shortened essentially so somebody could find out a problem that we had with using the app and I could change it straight away that meant that you could tailor and tweak the app in a way that made it much easier to use so let me show you what the app does uh, on the presentation and um, the app allows us to look at all the patients who are currently in patients and even patients in other hospitals and you could quickly at a glance see the hospital number, the date of birth, why they've been admitted, uh, what our management plan is and you could see where the patient is so if they're in a ward on a certain bed all that information is, is at the tip of your fingers and all that information is updated in real time. Um, the information is color-coded and it automatically updates the color based on which team the patient is in and whether they are booked uh, for emergency uh, theater. It allows you to quickly add a patient onto the app by tapping on the add button and you can easily fill in all the boxes in about a minute and there you go, your patient is added onto the handover list. There are ways in which the app 
doesn't quite match up to how we could use, uh, previously use the paper list. So for example, it's easy to write on paper list, but on the app, we still don't have the technology where you could easily write on the app. But there were ways that I tried to um, uh, counter this by um, making a note section where you could quickly type quick notes and that would be saved onto your app. What I was really pleased with was just the rapid uptake uh, and adoption of the app by the various members of the team. Um, the original plan was that we would try the app with a number of uh, staff and see whether they liked it and make suggestions and changed it. But what I found was basically I, I launched it and the next day people, everybody used it because it was just a much easier way of dealing with information, the amount of in information that we had. So I really want to thank the trust and the team for providing this uh, environment where innovation really thrives, um, where we could develop something that the clinicians developed and adopt it and use and is really supported by the IT team, uh, the staff here. And it's something that ha has begun to spread in other departments as well. Um, we are developing apps for um, referrals uh, with the cardiology team. Um, one of my colleagues has developed something for the logging in critical events and incidents. And working in Alderhey has really um, uh, allowed for this kind of thing to thrive and to develop. Um, so we hope that many other professionals would uh, pick this up and develop their own apps, uh, meeting their own requirements and benefiting the patients that they care for as a result. Well, hello, uh, my name's Dr. Richard Cook, and I've got a few minutes now where I'm going to talk to you about hand hygiene in hospitals and what I've been doing with the innovation department at Alder Hay concerning a product called Hygiene. So, a little bit more about Hygiene. Hygiene is what we call a personalised hand hygiene support system to improve patient safety, and I'll explain that over the next few minutes what, what that means in practice. So in terms of uh, people, the history, and how we've got to where we are, so as I said, my name's Dr. Richard Cook. Um, I'm a retired consultant medical microbiologist and was the director of infection prevention control at Alder Hay until set to the summer of 2017. And I think the reason the trust asked me to become director of infection prevention control is I have a passion about healthcare associated infections and of people avoiding a preventable infections and hand hygiene is a key part of that. And because of that, I was invited uh, a few years back now to talk to the innovation department about how we could try to tackle the problem of improving hand hygiene uh, in hospitals. And at that time, um, Alder Hay had an innovative relationship in terms of getting these sorts of ideas off the ground uh, through their innovation department uh, linked to a, a company called Nova, that's a startup consultancy to develop potential ideas and of course for, for financial backing uh, the support of Deep Bridge Capital and it's those three parties that have made it possible to get to where we are now. Um, I should also say, of course, we're living in a pandemic. Everyone knows about COVID-19. And on one hand, uh, hand hygiene is the first line of defence, as we all know, against uh, COVID. But in hospitals, the best figure, if you look at independent assessments of hand hygiene in hospitals, is at about 15%. But these are extraordinary times. And because of that, we've had to look at hygiene and adapt it to COVID-19. And in terms of the technology uh, for the NHS and the COVID crisis, whatever we produce has to be simple, low-tech, 
and have a low cost infrastructure. Uh, it, of course, in terms of busy staff, has to have no impact on workflow and it's got to be objective, non-judgmental and provide data in real time to help staff. And it's targeted at improving that compliance rate. Currently, as I said, at best 50% in hospitals and we wanted to see it at the 80, 90, 100% mark is what the public expect. But it's got to deliver in terms of confidence to management, staff and patients and it's got the ability to be rolled out across uh, the hospital. Uh, the system, when it was first designed, had a number of key components. The beacon, which is basically the link with the individual through their ID, NHS ID badge, the pickup station by the soap or gel dispenser to pick up the hand hygiene event that's taken place, a base station which allows the information be, to be downloaded through the iCloud onto a database and ultimately brought back to the user through some form of user interface. The COVID response has been to say, actually to get this system up and running, we will leave the beacon and the individual staff feedback to one side. We'll come back to that, but we'll focus up on the pickup, the base station, and the display back to staff. And that's what we're currently evaluating in pathology at Alder Hay. It works very simply, it applies to all soap and gel dispensers, so whenever you use a soap or dispenser that information is, goes through the base station and through the iCloud and gives you then counts of uh, hand hygiene events on an uh, hourly or by minute basis 24 7 and that information is then displayed back to the individual or with COVID now to the department to demonstrate a where they currently stand and then we put in targets probably a 20 percent improvement target to raise the bar to encourage staff to improve their hand hygiene performance. The design has to be smooth and simple, unobtrusive in the NHS. So this is an, an example of the sensor by a soap or gel dispenser. Uh, as you can see there, it can be applied to any manufacturer. It just sits below the dispenser. Uh, and the base station, again, simple, unobtrusive in a busy clinical area. You don't want any large uh, piece of, of, of kit. Um, and then the final, the key point is the feedback to staff. And this is a very rough and ready uh, diagram looking at uh, from time naught to uh, 10 in the evening, uh, uh, wash counts being picked up by the minute so that you can get an idea of the total numbers of wash counts per day. Um, it also has, of course, some indirect consequences. So hotel services, the people who fill up those dispensers, at the moment it's just done manually. There's no artificial intelligence, but this sort of system will identify the hot spots in a clinical area. It will give you a better idea of strategically where those dispensers are being used most. It will help with stock management and maintaining information. And of course, it will give automated alerts when those dispensers uh, are nearly empty and an empty dispenser should be uh, a never event in any hospital. And that is Hygiene. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Roland Partridge. I'm a consultant paediatric and neonatal surgeon here in Old Hay and a member of the innovation team. I'm going to talk to you just now about this mask, something that on the face of it, no pun intended, is a very simple product, but it's actually taken a huge amount of effort to get from concept to application. The story's really got three elements. Firstly, how we developed the product. Secondly, how we rolled it out within our hospital. And thirdly, how we have expanded the reach of this product to the wider public at large, and in return are bringing in some fi financial benefit back to the innovation department. So, it started when in May we realised that face masks were going to become a very important part of the battle against this pandemic and I cut up an old t-shirt, had some straps made of string held together by staples, evolved that through a number of different design styles, using different materials, even a 
Gore-Tex baseboard, which actually worked surprisingly well, but wasn't quite breathable enough. Uh, and then found an industrial partner to work with. And this is probably lesson one of, uh, of the design process is uh, my ethos has always been to engineer a product to design it for manufacture. Simply designing a product on a piece of paper can look very nice, but unless you understand how that's going to be manufactured and the complexities of producing it, uh, that product may fail. So design for manufacturer, working with the factory that's going to ultimately end up producing, or at least has the capacity to potentially end up producing your product is hugely important. And that's what we did with this. So I took my designs to a factory that we found nearby who manufacture cotton. They have a significant experience in the, the cutting and the stitching and the dyeing of cotton materials. And with them, rapidly prototyped and hundreds of iterations with minor, minor changes over a very intense couple of week period. I would meet with them every day. They would give me four or five new product prototypes. I would test them, get feedback from colleagues, meet with them in the evening. They would feed their feedback back to the factory in the following morning, they'd start working on, on updated versions. And through that very intense period of rapidly turning over hundreds of prototypes, making tiny little design changes each time, we've come up with a product which is uh, being very well received. It's got really three key design elements. Firstly, there's a nice flat aluminium nose bridge that is very malleable, sits onto the nose very well. And if you're wearing glasses, when you exhale, it doesn't mist up. It's got a nice channel around the side in which the elastic runs, which means it fits very closely against the cheek. And thirdly, it's made from a really high quality, ethically sourced, uh, washable 400 thread count cotton. So the product through a process of design for manufacture and rapidly prototyping has become brilliant. The second part of the story is how we rolled it out to the hospital. Our original driver was that we wanted to provide face coverings for all staff and visitors within our hospital. And that actually became a huge logistical challenge in terms of providing enough masks at the right time, in the right place, ensuring that stocks were maintained, managing the flow of that, ensuring that the factory could supply enough at a sufficient rate to mean that we didn't have people going without. And that, that became over about three or four weeks, a very, very significant management task. And the third part of the story is how we realised that it's a good product, it's fulfilling a significant need for us within the hospital, but there's great potential for this to benefit wider society and the public at large. Initially, we worked with a few retailers who carried the product on their site amongst alongside other products. And we very quickly realised that actually that probably wasn't the best strategy. What we really wanted and needed was a lightning conductor site, a website that was just selling these masks. And through a number of channels, we uh, have developed that and we now have what's called brilliantmasks.co.uk which is that lightning conductor for this product. It just sells this product. It's a um, collaboration between a number of different parties and it provides the product in a number of different designs and styles and it's focused solely on getting this product out there. It's been very well received. We, I think we're at about 82% five star rating on uh, Trustpilot at the minute, and we've been able to market it very energetically through social media channels have been particularly successful at spreading the word, and it's something that we're really very proud of. The estimates are that it's probably secured about 26 jobs in the manufacturing process and supply chain. We're selling currently around 30,000 a month, all being manufactured in the UK. And that has brought back in a significant number in the multiple thousands of pounds per month back into the Old Hay Innovation Department to help drive innovation in the future. So I hope that's been an interesting summary of this development of a product right, through rapid prototyping and working with industry, the logistics of ensuring that it fulfills the need within your hospital and then expanding that to be able to help society at large and at the same time bring return back to help drive innovation in the future. Thank you for listening.
Hello, I'm Rachel Harwood. I'm a paediatric surgical registrar at Older Hay Hospital and I'm also a research fellow. I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the work that we did around PPE during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. As I think we're all probably aware, there was a real need for um, PPE, especially during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there were multiple news articles about how this was um, a really critical problem, particularly in hospitals, where um, people were stockpiling um, PPE, where there wasn't enough for people in hospital. And so we wanted to think of a way to address this and find solutions for it. And there are really three approaches that we thought of. So we thought of alternative um, solutions for PPE. So, for example, using different types of masks um, or different devices. Um, we thought of ways that might be possible to reduce the amount of PPE that we were using. And we also wanted to look at ways that we may be able to reuse the PPE that we already had. The area that I focused on was the, the reuse of PPE. So first of all, we wanted to define the problem. We wanted to know how many masks are used every day and the answer is it's very hard to find out but hundreds in every hospital. They're used for every patient who had an aerosol generating procedures and at the beginning of the pandemic the list of um, procedures which were classified as aerosol generating were huge um, and so a huge number of masks were being used. We also wanted to look which masks were most commonly used and the pictures here are the ones that we most commonly used in Older Hay Hospital. Um, and particularly the mask at the bottom is the one that was most commonly used and the one that was most difficult to get hold of. And so that's one of the masks that we focused on particularly. We then wanted to consider the options of how we might be able to reuse them. And we needed options that were safe, that gave consistency of cleaning, that were easily available and were cost effective as well. Um, because these are all important aspects when we were considering how we could implement this. I put up a number of options there. We actually thought through a whole raft of, of things, but um, some of these seem very obviously not appropriate and some of them were things that we considered and then ruled out and some of them we went forward with. So autoclaving, applying heat treatment um, was very clearly not an option. The masks are made out of plastic and it would have melted them and they would have deformed, so we didn't use that. A seven-day quarantine um, was considered quite a good way to be sure that COVID had disappeared off the mask, but we weren't just concerned about COVID, we also know that patients in hospital have other bugs around them. And so we wanted not only to be able to clean the mask from SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, but also the other pathogens that were around. We considered ethylene oxide, which is a gas treatment, but this is actually noxious when you breathe it in. And whilst after cleaning, um, it should have dispersed, we didn't want to run the risk of exposing staff to potential noxious agents. So, so that was ruled out pretty quickly as well. And that left us with hydrogen peroxide, which is really commonly used to clean in lots of um, locations and particularly in animal units where they clean food and bedding and things like that. So we know it's very safe. We considered ultraviolet irradiation, which again is can very safely be applied, and plasma, which is an up and coming um, technology. We uh, that's a really interesting area, but it's not available in enough um, quantities to have been able to address the problem in, in the way that we wanted to. So we looked at hydrogen peroxide and UV irradiation. With UV irradiation, we actually. Um, thought about how that may affect the chemical properties of the mask and so we did less work around that and I'm going to focus from here on in about the hydrogen peroxide treatment that we looked at. So we, we then wanted to think well what are the really important aspects of cleaning a mask that we need to look at um, and these are the four main areas that we thought of so we wanted to see did we see any structural changes within the microstructure of the mask because it, it has really important filtering properties um, and so, and that affects the way that the mask effectively filters and protects the healthcare worker from, from um, breathing in viruses. We wanted to think about chemical changes because not only is it the filtering mechanism of the mask that provides protection, but the chemical properties of the polypropylene which the mask is made of um, mean that that provides additional protection, particularly because it has a charge associated with it. So the virus becomes attracted to those charged particles and can't pass through the mask. We then wanted to think about some of the macrostructural changes, so 
Um, I'm sure many of you have seen masks, but it, they have el elastic bands around the back and we wanted to see whether they would be affected by the cleaning. And really, most importantly, we then wanted to see how they were fit tested. So did they still fit and were they still effective after they've been cleaned and worn? I'm not going to talk you through the details because there's a lot, um, a lot of data behind this, but um, you can see here some really nice um, scanning electron microscopy images which look at the filtering layers of the mask and we find that masks are made of different layers. And we can see um, the picture A shows a, an unclean mask, it's got really smooth fibres, there are no real deposits on there. Whereas on picture B we can see that there are little depositions between the fibres, that the junctions are less clearly um, visible and we can see deposits if we really zoom in. And so we do see some microchemical, microstructural changes as a result of the cleaning process. I mentioned that the fit test is the most important aspect of this um, and you can see here that um, we looked at fit tested, in, fit tested masks in two groups. So we looked at 12 masks in total, six of them had actually been worn previously and then six of them had been put through um, three cycles of hydrogen peroxide. We actually find that both groups don't fit very well after they've been treated. Um, so the masks that had been worn previously, three of them passed the fit test and three of them failed a fit test. We also looked at the way that they've been stored to see if that makes a difference and it doesn't seem to. Um, but this really shows that having worn a mask just affects the way that it acts as a mask for the future with or without cleaning um, it. When we look at the masks that had gone through cleaning cycles, we also see that um, 60 percent of them failed their subsequent fit test. So this in combination with the finds that we had around microstructural changes, the chemical changes that we did find as well um, and some changes with regards to the elastic bands have meant that we haven't felt that we were able to go forward with reuse um, of PPE and so at this point we made a stop decision to, to stop um, looking into reuse of PPE in this way and the other solutions have become much more important so we're now using alternatives for masks, we use hoods, we have reusable respirators which are intended to be reused um, and we're significantly reducing the amount of PPE that we're using. The number of aerosol generating procedures that are classed as high risk have been massively reduced now that we know more about the disease and how it's spread and we're much more able to stratify the risks that patients give to us through the testing methods that we have now. And so whilst it's been a really valuable area to look at and it's a shame that we haven't been able to go forward with it, we feel um, very comfortable in the decision to put a stop to it at this point and explore the other solutions appropriately. Oh, hi, I, I'm Ian Hensley, one of the directors of innovation here, and I'm going to be chatting to you about our distancer. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk about the problem. Now, the problem was at the start of COVID uh, was contact spread. We were worried about you know, people coughing on their hands, contaminating surfaces. How could you avoid touching door handles when you're in the hospital? Now, the, the genesis of the idea has actually been you know, in the making for a while because months and months before COVID broke out, we'd actually been experimenting with our partner 3 life prints uh, on this copper infused uh, 3D printing material, which was antiviral. And there was a competition uh, about how would you reduce spread of infection in the space station? Because the space station, believe it or not, has got a real problem with bacteria. They love growing up there. Uh, and I came up with an idea of what if you could carry around your own door handle, or if you use your own personal door handle, which would fit over you know, the pressure doors in the space station, and you'd be able to therefore only ever touch one handle to reduce spread. Uh, but it was a children's competition, so I thought I probably shouldn't enter it myself. Uh, and uh, the part of the idea, but when COVID broke out, um, we had this problem, don't touch uh, door handles. The expression was, you know, the, the door, door handles are lava, and I'd, I'd find myself I'd be trying to, to grab a door in an unusual place, thinking, oh, people have touched that bit less. So the, the concept went like this. We thought, right, what do you carry around with you a lot that could be used? We thought, well, what about your ID badge? What if you could use your ID badge to open the doors? So we started thinking with our 3D print partners. We drew a few sketches out. Um, and we thought, what if you could attach like a hook and a 
push plates to um, uh, to your ID badge. So here's a picture here of one of the prototypes of it, of the distancer, um, which is just an ID badge which was attached, you know, just I've got it here on my on my on my hip. Um, so you've got an ID badge there. You've got a hook on it. You can open the doors and you can push them open and you can beep your way through the you know the the, the contact ID and then it just sits at your hip there. Uh, so you're only ever touching this part of the handle. Uh, so this is one of our, our, uh, our nurses modeling one of the prototype versions there. Now this, this process uh, was quite involved, we didn't just make this. Um, you know, the very first one was enormous actually, so it's, it's up on the, the shelf over there. And a huge hook in it, the hook's too big, the hook keeps on breaking off. And then we were made out of the wrong type of material. It was too brittle and too fragile. And then we found actually it's better to put the hook on the other side. Um, and then we made the handle slightly smaller. And then we started experimenting with different types of material. We eventually figured out that um, 3D printing wasn't the best way to do it. And we, we came up with an injection molding technique. And I love it. In fact, I'll show you a video of the of how the injection molded. This is where you inject kind of hot plastic into a pre-made mold. Um, and it can create them at an incredible pace, really knock them out. So we we had this idea, we'd, we'd gone through lots of iterative uh, designs using initially rapidly created 3D printed prototypes uh, and then eventually moving to an injection molding technique. Now, the, the next thing was, well, one, how do we get into everyone's hands? So we made 4,000 of them using the injection molding technique and started distributing it to all of our staff. Um, and I've got a picture actually of, uh, of uh, our reporters and everyone else when they started to get their own ones. Um, and then we thought, well, can we sell them? Can we commercialise this? And the answer is yes, because people were desperate for this type of thing. And we started selling it to KPMG, uh, we started selling it to other people who had big office buildings uh, so that they could have a bit more security around getting into their building. And we even started creating these videos uh, uh, just to try and demonstrate how using UV light uh, you could reduce contamination uh, using the distancer, and that was an important part of the commercialization strategy. We even got into how do you do specific type of uh, targeted uh, social media ads. We actually we got even got onto um, uh, Amazon, uh, which is incredibly difficult. All the legwork for this was done by our partners, New Life Prints. Um, and it was great to see it out there, getting sold, bringing resource back to the hospital, great partnership uh, with a company. We even patented it, we put an application for a patent in, 50-50 uh, with, uh, with 3D Life Prints. Um, and it was uh, a, a amazing to think that from idea to commercialization and IP protection, that was all done in a three month period. And it just goes to show that you can actually do this thing quickly uh, if you really put your mind to it. Uh, so again, happy to answer anything in the chat about a distancer. Uh, but where it's gone and, and any questions that you might have. Hi, welcome to today's talk. We're going to be looking at how we developed a telemeneutology program in response to our COVID-19 pandemic. 
we're also going to describe how we managed to do that in four weeks. The challenge was a big one. Our neonatology consultants uh, were, were struggling. The size of the challenge was not insignificant. They normally run at a low level of consultant staff sickness and cover both work at the Liverpool Women's Hospital and at Alderhey. However, just prior to lockdown, they had three of their consultants off on long-term leave. And as soon as lockdown hit, this quickly um, increased to seven out of 14 of their consultants, either off with sickness, isolating due to COVID or shielding for protection. This equated roughly to a loss of 40% of clinical facing time. And the real bottom line here was the service wasn't sustainable as it was. They were going to have to, to, to cut back on, on what they could offer. And that was not something they really wanted to do. So that was a big challenge. If we take a small backward step, we can see that the neonatology team were already embarking in conjunction with the neonatal surgical team on a journey on on how they would build um, neonatal services for the future. And as part of this work, um, they held a virtual care symposium on the 2nd of March. And presenting at this um, was Dr. Jennifer Fine, uh, a neonatologist from the Mayo Clinic, uh, describing how she used telehealth um, to support the care of, of neonates across her state and how they uh, improved outcomes and was really showcasing that to us and it really resonated with all of our staff and left everybody buzzing with ideas. However, this, this work towards the neonatal unit is, is, has been years in the making and there'll be a few years yet. But in the background, COVID was starting to really ramp up in the UK. Um, after the presentation on the 2nd, uh, on the 5th of March, the first death from COVID was announced in the UK. Very quickly, the shop in people's minds and essentially Chris Dewhurst said, we need to get this. So we started working that up and as time progressed, COVID started evolving. By the 12th of March, there was 590 cases in the UK and already by the 18th of March, the government made an announcement that all schools would be closing. So in that short time, we, we looked at what we needed. We, we saw our staffing challenges coming and basically looked at the challenges, looked at the needs and said, we need to get this in. So let's uh, let's start testing and training. We located some equipment and essentially by the 27th March, we had our first telemedicine robot installed and working in the women's hospital. Now, interestingly, on the 23rd of March, lockdown began. So from having a a bit of an inkling of what was coming at the beginning of March. By the end of the month, we had got the project in uh, with some uh, loan equipment, got most of the staff trained and developed by the end of the month. Throughout the April, we continued our training and uh, by the end of that month, we had got all of our neonatal surgeons and neonatologists trained in using the equipment. Use of the equipment increased and increased very quickly it became apparent that we, we needed better equipment. Um, our clinician said, this is great, but we need more. Um, so very quickly we identified that and ordered ourselves uh, some new equipment. By the 1st of June, we had four new devices arrive. And uh, as our, our journey progressed, by August 2020, we were delivering about 130 consultations a month. So very quickly from nothing in March to uh, high usage in August, uh, it really saved our bacon. So who did this? Well, the team involved are really the reason why this managed to, to happen so quickly and at such pace. I was the project lead, ably supported by our IT wizard, Leila. And I think one of the key components of the su success of this project was the, the strong clinical direction. And that was really championed on, on the women's side by Fozzie Pays and Chris Dewhurst and, and on Alder Hay's side by uh, Joe Minford, the clinical director for neonatal surgery. But this cascaded out. The IT team, both at the Liverpool women's and the Alder Hay sites were integral in getting this up and running. And everybody just worked together the, the, the standout difference in this project is there were no blockers that anybody wasn't tackling and tackling hard and those blockers disappeared fast. The, the paediatric and the neonatal surgeons 
jumped on board really quickly and the nursing staff on both sides just engaged so quickly in something that was so different. All of the staff were clinicians, they look after babies, what they are not is IT wizards and they hold their hands up and say we're not. Um, but despite that they engaged the topic with uh, gusto and, and really ran with it. All the while, in the background, we were getting really good support from our colleague, uh, Dr. Jennifer Fang, in the Mayo Clinic, and uh, and the delivery teams and uh, and the company at InTouch and Teladoc uh, were great. So this is where we started. This is with our um, lunar equipment, and uh, in the bottom picture you can see why um, Dr. Yoxall was called Bill on a Stick. He was a at home shielding, I believe, and. Uh, was a, up until recently was our number one user of the telehealth services delivering a neonatal rounding uh, at the surgical site um, and you can see here one of our uh, ANNP nurse consultants and a member of the surgical team going on the ward round with me. In the top picture you can see Ms Minford delivering a, a very very modern consultation. She's there with the dad of the baby in the neonatal unit of the women's hospital assessing this surgical baby but mum also joined in with FaceTime uh, so it was a it really was a, a, a true full family affair and uh, th this was all done on equipment loaned. The clinical impact was significant. We were able to deliver services that would have otherwise just have had to been reduced, relocated. On Alder Hayside we were able to deliver daily neonatal ward rounds, urgent ad hoc advice and also had the capacity to deliver a neonatologist within minutes notice to any deterioration of a neonate. All the while uh, they were also available there to support any of the ANMPs uh, on site in the clinical care of the surgical neonates. On the, the women's site there was delivery of a regular surgical ward round of the, of the babies uh, identified by the neonatologists and also um, ad hoc reviews and even during the, that, that initial period when there was significant concern about um, transport and transfer and there was significant pre uh, pressure on NWAS, the Northwest Ambulance Service, um, there was also virtual support for some uh, interventions um, and I know the surgeons were supporting the neonatologists to do minor procedures to, to prevent any delay or reliance on, on transport during that initial uh, pressure. But very quickly we moved through that stage, got to the part where we needed new equipment and then it arrived and it was awesome. Um, and what you can see in our next slide is uh, an example of one of our neonatal surgeons reviewing the baby from home. So if I just play that for you. Hello, my name is Chan and I'm one of the surgical registrars. So uh, I've been asked by the nurses to have a look at your baby and I've brought along the, a robot consultant. So if you don't mind, I'll bring the robot in and it's Mr. Hennessy. He's the surgical consultant. So I'm alright. So this is Mr. Hennessy. Hi there. Hi, uh, hello. <laughs> and then we can answer any questions that you have. I'm just going to look at the observations here. Okay, so that's observations which are looking good. And I'm going to look down at the tummy. He's handling quite well, Mr. Hennessy. Yeah, that uh, looks very good actually. So looking at him just generally from the end of the bed looks good. Examination's looking very settled as well. Good. And the dressing looks intact, nothing else going on. Well I'm I'm happy there. I'm happy. Um, so just to just to reassure you there, uh, I think that tummy's looking nice and non distended and um, I think we just keep, carry on with the plan just as we are. And there we have it, um, a nice uh, little consultation video. You could see in that the, the level of detail you could see, and whilst um, in 
telehealth you can't lay hands on the baby the, the surgeon could quite obviously see uh, his uh, registrar palpating the, the abdomen and, 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 and could see the movements of the baby all very uh, clinically useful information but we had to to sense how we were going as we went along and how we did that was twofold first of all our parent evaluation all of our early feedback was very positive and in some cases better than we were previously able to deliver which was a surprise and um, all the parents felt that they could see and hear and ask questions with their consultant and, and no parent left not knowing the plan for the baby and and this was a bit of a departure from the norm because typically what happened was that the referring neonatologist examined the baby and then left and phoned the surgeon and had a clinician to clinician referral discussion what changed with this service was that that discussion became part of the consultation and the, the parent and the family were part of that discussion and despite PPE you didn't need to wear it on telehealth so that the parent could see the face of the surgeon that they were talking to and despite all of the challenges with, with everything going on no parent was dissatisfied with the quality of service received and everybody got how important it was during a, a pandemic so the, the, the parents really saw the value in it which is great the other half of the, the, the coin is, is the staff evaluation and there was obvious anticipation and I've alluded to it previously a significant proportion of the staff ha, are, are long serving NHS veterans and generally rate themselves somewhere as below average or poor with IT skills yet despite all this 90% of them saw value in using this and 94% identified that they were going to support the system in the future and they've also identified that this will become part of the, the, the new normal in the future as well and they also identified that they they could speak at length with parents in a way that they hadn't been able to do before and that this had a lot of value especially in the, in the realms of uh, consent and understanding of of the clinical situation for the parents and, and generally despite their initial reluctance and nervousness about the technology really took hold of it staff feedback these are direct quotes su supplied by the teams involved they rapidly identified that we could benefit much more if it wasn't just the neonatal surgeons but our other speciality and tertiary uh, colleagues could really help really bring the decisions around the care to the bedside regardless of the geography we have to be open and frank about it there are some things that you can't do in telehealth uh, that, that you need to do in real life sometimes there there still needs to be that face-to-face -face and physical interaction and one of the disadvantages was um, it's much better than I expected it um, and again there's this feeling for the need for a physical connection with the patient and, and I don't think we'll ever get over that I think that's an essential part of the, uh, the examination of a child but it's good that, that, that despite this disadvantage it was identified that it would help them target when that was most needed so that's where we got through and 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 now that the, it's in use uh, and being used regularly uh, we're, we're we're looking to see where else we can adopt this to help us get us through wave two and our, our eyes are now on a pediatric high dependency care in the region so the consultant presence uh, on the ward isn't 24 hours so uh, what what we're proposing using the devices for is to support our high dependency consultants and critical care consultants coming into our high dependency unit at any time of the day or night to support a, a deteriorating child to review children that are admitted out of ours to make sure that a senior decision is made at the outset and also to potentially build in a little bit of staffing resilience if there is a consultant that is isolating they can dial in and really support their colleagues and, and what, what the telehealth device allowed them to do was contribute uh, to the team effort that was getting people through this huge demand on healthcare. And as you can see there, they identified being part of nighttime huddles, supporting deteriorating children, even outside of HDU if, if, if the, the need was there. And also um, to use the device to potentially shield other members of staff. So that, that's sort of our use cases for HDU in the future. But we're exploring lots of other use cases and using it to, to 
prioritise staff groups to, to look at which teams are vulnerable and um, how we can protect them, use teleshielding to protect them. And, uh, and lastly, how we can take this learning and, and share it regionally. And um, we're just in the process of starting up a, a pilot with one of our referring sites on how we could use this technology to support the care of deteriorating children across the region uh, and also to support um, one of our real uh, drivers which we're calling inreach the ability for not only Alderhey to go to other hospitals but for other hospitals to come in and support paediatricians from uh, surrounding district general hospitals to be part of their child's care whilst they're not in their hospital and then repatriating the the child back to their local hospital and and being part of that transition and being part of their care all of the time well that's the end of today's talk i do hope you enjoyed it and if you have any questions um, if you could just email simon.linford at aldehay.nhs.uk i'd be happy to address them thank you Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the organizers of the Giant Health Meeting. Uh, I think that is an amazing opportunity for us to uh, show you what we're doing. I'm Rafael Guerrero. I'm a heart surgeon for children and adults, and the center and a medical director of healthcare innovation at Alderhey. And today I'm going to talk to you about immersive technology in healthcare. Um, and this was uh, kind of unleashed when all COVID-19 started and COVID-19 around February or March started and we needed to find different ways of working. And we have, a, in the heart center, we operate probably about four to 500 little babies with very bad conditions every year. And we needed to carry on providing the service. So we were thinking in different ways to do it. And, uh, and we were come across with the uh, HoloLens many years ago um, now we were coming with, together with new technologies of using augmented reality for that. And so I'm going to talk about the evolution from how to use it in, during COVID-19, how we develop our service, and how we protect the patients and the use of the immersive technology. Um, so uh, we have all the high heart centers, it covers about 8 million people and the population in the northwest of England, the Isle of Man and North Wales. Um, we cover all the babies and adults with malformation of the heart. We are born with malformation of the heart. Um, so it's a big team, and we needed to have a very strategic, proactive plan when the COVID-19 pandemic, COVID pandemic arrived, uh, because we, there was no, uh, no chance for us to close, uh, because half of our patients are newborns, and they needed um, immediate care as soon as they are born. So there is, we needed to carry on with the service, and we needed to have a plan. And sometimes, uh, yeah, yeah, the best accelerator is a crisis. So in this moment, you probably have heard during the morning the amazing team of the innovation team of Alderhey with so many incredible ideas of how to help to provide uh, this and, and during the crisis. And we were um, part of that. And we have several goals of the P number, if you want to call it, of protection, um, which are described in that area. And in view that we were in, in, involved in developing immersive technology with the uh, uh, momentum reality with the HoloLens, we say, how can we use this during these times? And not just during the COVID-19 crisis, but in, in beyond this, how can we adapt to, to do that? And, uh, and, and as a background, and probably you have heard from all my colleagues before about how big is all their hay, how care for so many people around the country. And the challenge was we wanted to reduce, uh, you know, the number of people in the war rounds. We needed to keep uh, the, the expertise available 24-7. We needed to share information, collaborate in time, and communicate remotely for that. And, uh, and the solution to become is using HoloLens 2, which is a, a device uh, which produces augmented reality, no virtual reality, or mixed reality, you want to call it. But the key change was the uh, appearance of uh, an application called Dynamic 365 Remote Assist. And this allowed the communication lacking probably two years ago. This was a game changer between the, uh, a completely different device in which was more with better visuals, better technology, 
and the use of remote assist, which allow you a hands-free communication and, and using Microsoft Teams, which is available in our hospital and probably in most NHS hospitals, you could be able to communicate with each other very rapidly 24-7. Um, you were able to visualize holograms in front of you, <clears throat> in which you show the x-rays, the CT scans. So in, in, in summary, we were able to, uh, we were able to use these um, one person visualizing the patients and the rest of the people were remotely. And I'm going to show you some examples of, of how we've been using this technology. Um, um, and how it works is, is a device required, you know, it could be an iOS or Android remote uh, device, and you can have Microsoft all against number one or number two. You can collaborate. We just need a device and need a Teams license. Not necessarily a Teams license, but that, that will help. So this is all, all is, a, is a package with Microsoft will help to develop this. Um, but it was very rapidly uh, put into place in the hospital. So right, let's go right to the to the <clears throat> to the actions i think because um a part of that introduction i think is important for you to visualize exactly what we are and this is just the beginning we have developed more even further from that but this is a normal war round will take about 10 to 15 people uh, in between student doctors student nurses the senior doctors uh, etc and in this case our was one of our senior uh, uh, registrars was going to run the war round with the HoloLens, and the rest of the consultants were going to be uh, remotely, either in their office. Or, and, and you can see that one of the colleagues was completely linked, which they will be in charge of the EPR. So they will be showing the EPR as holograms in front of him. So he will be able to have all the information in front of him and at the same time be able to communicate with the patient. And in the right, in the bottom part of uh, the screen, you can see that uh, two of three consultants and two of my colleagues were in an office uh, and we were just following the war round from our uh, computer, from our laptop with uh, the view of the, that's the view of the, of the HoloLens with the EPR in, in, as a hologram floating in front of you. Yeah. So actually, the, um, and this is just working and we are in just open laptop, it could be a phone and you can see exactly what he's doing in there. Um, the other procedure is like um, the other application is I know in clinical settings is if we think about the three main applications that we are going to talk is the clinical or me direct medical application is the um, if you if you require in the middle of the night an expert advice instead of them coming or being next to you you know one for COVID but in the future at any time quite often it's a phone call describe the, the problem with the patients then please send me the data of the images of the x-rays, then you discuss, it's very, uh, it's not complicated, but that's the way that it is. With this, it's a complete revolution, because you are, as, a, as an expert, being uh, far away, or essentially you are part of the, part of the um, solution there. So, so this is a patient who, <clears throat> we are going to guide him that you know to do about the HoloLens, so is very briefly going to decide what to do. And uh, so you can see the, the view of the, um, of the echocardiogram with the heart beating, and the expert consultant is guiding him how to do it. So you have to turn the prop into the right side, to the left side, and to make a decision live immediately about what to do about these patients. And sometimes are life-saving decisions. So this completely changed the way that you communicate. Uh, and to be on the complicated specialties, but if you apply this to uh, being in the uh, A and E department, and you need very rapidly the expertise of, of the neurosurgeon, at the same person assessing the patient, and everybody will join remotely in a team situation, in a, all together and a little MDT. So I think is. The potential is tremendous. I don't think that we are just scratching. We are just scratching the surface. And I think that the more that people will use, they will find a lot more different ways to use it. So we, we, we actually did a little bit of a questionnaire of a survey because we really wanted to measure was that making a difference? Because one of the main challenges that you have when you implement technology or anything like that is change. So nobody likes changes. And, and I think that this is a change. 
uh, a significant change, and, uh, and, and I think that it's important to measure what it was. And we did a survey, and actually, from people who have never seen the technology, that they found it useful. Um, and I think that our challenge for the future will be not just for this type of technology in general, it's when we are doing these things, is how we maintain the change, how we can not convince, but how we can involve the people to carry on with this. And that's it's a because I think another, again, is a very complex baby uh, in which have, as you can see, an intensive care following a, a hard procedure. And we needed to make decisions that probably was around midnight about uh, an, as another operation is going to need it. And our colleague is using HoloLens and he phoned me to make a decisions about this. <clears throat> and then you can see in the right hand side, and I answer with my phone, and I can see the scan of the heart that he's performing at the same time. And then we can dis make a decision about what to do with the heart. And that's his view. I mean, this is not practice, so, you know, we just decide, film it and see what happened. And, and we, I can see the monitor with the vital signs of the baby, and, and we can see, obviously, the baby. But was, once again, at the mid decisions between a group of clinicians without being there, and you can see exactly that, uh, or you, it's like you being there and being the eyes and the ears of the person who is actually in front of the patient. We, we tried because when we were in the pandemic, can we use it with PPE? And, and the, the truth is like, not at just us, but other centers um, in, in, uh, around the country have been trying and, and it's more than possible. So, so the Wi-Fi and the communication is still the same. It doesn't affect anything like that. So you are able to use this with PPE and, and the cleaning process is very simple. So I think that that's good news because uh, it means that you can, uh, this is not going to stop, you know, whenever we have one pandemic might come the next one, or if we want to reduce infections around the country, we can still use in this, and we don't need to be, um, you reduce significantly the number of people using PPE, which was a massive problem, you know, a few months ago, because you just need one person in front of, of the patient, the rest of the people will be remotely, and the, 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 the headset, will take it out and you just wipe it and it's clean for the next person to use it. So I think that is, is terrific from that point of view. And you, it's portable, so you can walk from anywhere, from, you know, from one part of the hospital to the next part of the hospital to an office, etc. So this is another example in which one of the things that we hope it over is how can we uh, have a more accurate information from the, from the patient. And this is why probably it's about precision medicine. It's about how can we have a bit, you know, better imaging to make decisions. And in, in this case, we have uh, in the cath lab. Cath lab is like the catheter where they do catheter for the heart. And and in uh, and in this case, one of our colleagues is wearing the Hololens, and is able to. We are going to do a procedure in which they are going to place a stent inside the heart, and. We went outside in another room, and we can visualize in our laptop exactly what he can see. This is phenomenal, and this is this is just the beginning. We have so many uh, ideas now on, on how we are going to develop this from even using augmented reality with haptics to to be as a part of our training and um, and simulation. And uh, and then. The, the next is, is advanced visualization, and I think that one of the two left areas that we need to talk about is how can we um, visualize in a much better way the, the body, not necessarily the heart. In this case, we are using holograms, as you can see, floating in front of us when we are going to the operation, and the aim is to overlay the hologram or the image on top of the heart so we can make a, you know, a much better assessment of the, of the problem. So they, there is many uh, ad advantages. So you will reduce the number of staff needed in the operating theater or, or even in the intensive care in the world. It will lower the risk of infection, prevent disruption. It reduces the number of people in the war rounds that we have seen and make it more efficient because you just strictly you are doing that rather than being distracted. Um, consultants or the clinicians can consult colleagues without waiting. Uh, uh, for them to be available, so it could be any time. And many things in our specialty are time critical, um, and that does need to be done. Uh, 
and it's hands-free, so you can move around anywhere, you know, in the hospital. You don't need to carry, push it, or anything like that. So I think that is, there is potential, and I think that the more people that are involved, the, the better that will be developed. You know, normally, the, the downsides, because we need to talk about these things, is emergency, you know, the face-to-face -face communications. Naturally, as humans, as doctors, and people working in healthcare, we like to be in communication with each other because uh, genetically, that's how we've been designed to be. But uh, within Mercy, obviously that doesn't happen. But the truth is that we probably need to think about it right. It probably most of our communication nowadays are by a screen. So it's, a sc it's a, rather than face to face. And this is in normal life. And I'm not justifying that, but it, it is something that we, we somehow we have adapted to that. And finally, uh, education and training. Uh, this can be used, uh, I'm not going to put because this is from one of our other companies who is producing already uh, self uh, um, videos for, to, no, sorry, no videos, like uh, already tools to learn and to, be, to do simulation, either anatomy in the left-hand side or a simulation of a patient having a heart attack. And that's phenomenal. So there, there is absolutely no, uh, uh, this can go for, for a long time. As you can see, we just place the holograms in the atrium in the hospitals and people can walk around. The students can be at home and they follow that. And in the other side, they can see a patient, which is a hologram of a patient created to simulate a heart attack. So, and learning, as we always say, I think that I'm completely convinced that it has to be now anytime, anywhere. I don't think that the students are or anybody want to be sitting in a room, uh, maybe go for a coffee, but uh, people are learning anytime, anywhere, uh, and that's, that's what is happening nowadays. Thank you very much, and I hope that you enjoy this, and we're happy to give, uh, answer any questions. Hi, my name is Ben Sainsbury, and I'm the CEO of Marion Surgical. And what we're going to show you today is a little bit about our existing simulator. And then I'm going to talk about our exciting collaboration that we have with Alder Hay that's in the works. Uh, so what you see here is my partner, Dr. Rajiv Singhal, who's a urologist at the Michael Guerin Hospital in Toronto. And he's wearing a VR headset. And so he's fully immersed in the operating room. And he's got his hands on a real surgical tool that's attached to our proprietary haptics robots uh, and these robots are providing force feedback so that it actually feels like when he's making the puncture into the skin to go down to the kidney uh, that it actually feels like you're t touching real tissue so a lot of our uh, R&D has been uh, working with surgeons to get that realistic feel um, so I'm gonna let Rajiv uh, talk about the clinical application of this tool because he's much better at talking about that uh, you know, essentially, I'm a surgeon. I've been a surgeon for many years, and I've really seen over that time a magnitude shift in how we train our, our patients, how we basically learn procedures, and how we get better. And you need to, I mean, even our trainees today need that period and that experience of, of being in an operating room. But operating room resources are expensive. We have to be a first and foremost mindful of patient safety. If we can create opportunities to allow our trainees to practice and develop some skill acquisition outside of the operating room, by the time they come into the operating room and work alongside of us, they'll be starting at a higher level. That makes sense. It's safer for patients. It's, uh, it's cost effective because we can shorten the time that we use in the operating room to teach and I think these things uh, are all very exciting. So the Marion Surgical Platform, this immersible virtual reality platform, not only can we potentially simulate a whole variety of procedures uh, to to allow trainees to to work work themselves up to a certain skill point you could actually even have someone like me take real images so I'm in the operating room tomorrow for example and I could put up the CT scan of what I'm planning to do tomorrow and what I would normally do is just a chart review in the office and uh, but you know wouldn't it be great if I actually have the ability to look at that man's or that woman's scan 
upload it into the Marion Surgical server and, and essentially do a trial run and, and, a, and a practice run of that procedure. It's, it's got to make us better surgeons and ultimately I think that's much, much better for our patients. You know, this idea of, of essentially being able to do tomorrow's case tonight or tomorrow's case the day before. So that's the real exciting piece, this idea of being able to rehearse surgical procedures in advance of actually doing them. And, and ultimately we're all looking for ways to improve our patient outcomes, to do it in a way that's as safe as we can make it for, for everybody involved. And obviously in, a, in an era where healthcare is increasingly expensive and certainly surgical care is increasingly expensive, so I'm very excited about what we can do and, and where we can go with Marion Surgical. We've expanded our team and we've opened up an office in, in Manchester and we're very excited about this collaboration with Alder Hay. Uh, add a cardiac procedure, so a children's heart procedure to our simulator. A lot of the development that we have been working on for the PCNL simulator, especially the part where you are using a wire to navigate to the ureter, um, is applicable to cardiac procedures. Um, and also the x-ray view and wire behaviors. And So while it's not gonna be easy, we, we feel like we're not starting from scratch. We're basically, adapting some of the things, uh, some of the learnings from the PCNL um, over to the cardiac procedure. We think what Alder Hayes doing with innovation is remarkable and we're happy to be along for the journey. Hi, so my name is Darren Gates. I'm one of the Pediatric Intensive Care Doctors and Clinical Innovation Consultants here in Alder Hay. And I wanted to tell you a bit about our work with digital assistants and chatbots. So back in 2016, we started a, a collaborative project with partners at the Science and Technology Foundation Council, Hartree Centre and IBM on utilising AI for patient benefit. The first problem that we arrived at was uh, an interesting one, really. Coming to hospital can be intimidating, frightening or anxiety inducing and that's true for the children and the parents that bring them. This uh, picture is from a film called The Mo a Monster Calls and it's often the experience uh, that children have uh, coming into hospital. The monster could be the disease or the procedures, uh, the treatment or the environment that they're coming into. And there's some fascinating research uh, about when we're scared, pain is heightened and memories enhanced. Uh, potentially phobias developed and the retention of information is impaired. A significant amount of anxiety is caused by uh, unanswered questions that people have coming into hospital. Where do I go? Who will I see? What happens if I need a blood test? And what's involved in an anaesthetic? We saw that the ability to access uh, answers to this information anytime, anywhere, could be hugely beneficial in improving patients' experience and relieving anxiety. So we started on a project to build an engaging virtual assistant that would be accessible uh, before they arrive at hospital, during their time here, and then after when they've gone home uh, to answer any particular questions that they had along that journey. A bit like a friend who's been there before and can tell you what to expect. So the benefits of this include facilitating appointments and understanding where people get stuck in the process, uh, gaining insight into the questions that matter most to patients and providing answers to them along the journey. We also get um, stats around the frequently asked questions that they uh, have put into the system and can then address any particular issues they have. We believe that this also empowers children to ask questions that they wouldn't uh, usually feel comfortable uh, doing and engages them in their care. Our first version uh, called Ask Ollie launched in 2018 and was available through a custom made patient experience app uh, called Alder Play and later via our website. We invested uh, time in making responses context specific, so handling things like an aphora, that is a question where the preceding statement is needed for context, uh, as you can see here with the question, will it hurt? We built a robust way to iteratively improve uh, the system, so tracking questions and analysing confusion matrices uh, and k-fold tests to assess the precision, the recall and F1 scores for our natural language processing model and we're continually improving the logic within the system. In addition to this, we're able to track the performance uh, of the system on a question-by-question -question basis 
and allocate tasks for improvement, such as improving the answer or uh, adding a new response. Obviously, uh, 2020 has been a particularly unusual year for all of us, and the way things flow in the hospital has changed. So we've had to adjust the assistant to respond to this. We recently launched version two of the system with an improved UI and adaptations for the rapidly changing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, such as details on the visiting restrictions uh, in the hospital and how um, parents and uh, other visitors can attend. We've named this second version Arty, as in artificial intelligence, and we've made it even more accessible on our website. We're continuing to expand it with new uh, knowledge domains and features. A small patient impact study prior to the pandemic identified uh, at the time that the, the tool was being underutilised. The link was rather buried in the website and we've addressed that by making it more accessible to people. Uh, however, though, of those that engaged with it at that time, 100% felt it improved their experience. They felt there was good information provided and would like to see continued development and more con content added. Um, and they'd certainly recommend it to others attending the hospital. Through it, we've spotted uh, multiple issues and bottlenecks in patient flow, such as finding uh, specific clinics or car parking issues that has led to other improvements within the hospital. With our growing experience in building digital assistance in the past year, we've also applied it to the problem of staff information. So we built a digital assistant called uh, Sally, uh, staff advice and link information, to answer frequently asked questions uh, ahead of contacting the support team. We've tried applying a more generative response in this version, searching a repository of documents to uh, generate answers. This has had some mixed results and uh, it's not always surfaced the uh, relevant information. Sally was created as part of our rapid response at the start of the COVID-19. Our biggest challenge was being able to keep pace with the evolving advice as it was being delivered to us. Questions were also being submitted by staff that were outside of the limited scope of the assistant's depth of knowledge, which was also a challenge. We did look at how we would evaluate this against this hierarchy. We clearly created a stable platform and it was easy for the users to use and interact through. And therefore we've been able to demonstrate that a digital assistant for staff use is useful to augment against other communication channels. So going forward in 2021 as a part of our future development, we will be collaborating with our staff advice and liaison service, you can see where we've got the name Sally from, to develop the scope and content and then relaunch it into the organisation. However, we've learned a great deal from this process and are looking at future adaptations that will enhance functionality on this and other projects. There are many potential features to enhance um, hospital digital assistance in the future. Uh, including voice interaction, integration with other services to support tasks and further personalisation. And we believe that there will be a, a valuable part of future healthcare, both for patients and staff, to improve uh, experience and enhance the delivery of care. Hi everybody, my name is Kevin Woodward and I work for STFC as the Innovation Manager at the Hartshire Centre and today I'll be talking about the work that we've been doing with the Alder Hay Innovation Team. So I'll explain briefly about STFC. So STFC are the Science and Technology Facilities Council and we have large-scale national facilities and research and innovation campuses which are spread across the UK. Part of the mission is to develop advance technologies and innovate to solve real world challenges. And I work at one of the facilities which is called the Hartree Centre, which is based in Daresbury in the Northwest. So the Hartree Centre is STFC's high performance computing data analytics and cognitive technology centre and provides businesses with access to powerful technologies, facilities and scientific computing expertise. The main purpose is to apply the latest capabilities in computing technologies to industrial challenges. And like I say, we're based at Daresbury, which is in the northwest of England. We're not too far away from all the Hay Children's Hospital. So at the centre, we have some very impressive platforms and facilities. We have high performance computing platforms, IBM, plat IBM data centric platforms, access to IBM Watson, supercomputer, quantum learning machine, and some very impressive visual computing facilities. We also have some excellent people 
people from all the science backgrounds, plus software developers, mathematicians, data scientists, technical architects. My role is in within business and innovation development. And we work with inventors and innovators <clears throat> to realize the technology's potential by commercial and industrial application of the real world, particularly in the UK. So why are we working with all the hay? Well, a few years ago in 2016, a collaboration between all the hay and the Hartree Centre was established with the aim of becoming the world's first cognitive hospital, applying cognitive computing to transform working practices and enhance patient experience. The aim is to enable clin clinical staff to spend less time on paperwork and more time with patients. During the relationship, all the hay have demonstrated that they are an ambitious industrial partner who recognise the potential and value of applying innovation, not only at their hospital, but also looking for wider application elsewhere in healthcare. So what are we doing with all the hay? Well, the main activity that our team has been involved in has been establishing the chatbot service, which is formerly known as Ask Ollie and is now called Artie. This involves the application of IBM Watson to answer patients and their families' questions to reduce anxiety prior to visiting the hospital. This results in less cancellations, better healthcare procedures via improved sentiment analysis and more efficient use of clinicians' time. As a result of the COVID-19 crisis, the Hartree Centre were approached by all the hay to look into whether the chatbot could be repurposed to answer inquiries from staff regarding relevant information to the crisis. For example, working from home, regarding personal protective equipment, and also other information regarding staff well-being. SDFC responded quickly to this request, and within weeks, a new chatbot was established known as Sally, Staff and Link Information. This proof of concept has proved to be valuable during the crisis and raised important technical questions regarding the logistics of keeping the chatbot up to date during a rapidly changing situation. We've been involved in several other activities with all day. Uh, one of the ones that I've been involved with is investigating the potential for commercial opportunities, looking at how we can form, potentially form a spin-out company or license to a third party, the technologies that are involved in the chatbot. I'm also involved in an ongoing proof of concept where we're looking at rolling out the chatbots to a non-children's hospital, i.e. Warrington Hospital, in partnership with, with all the hay. We've looked at enhancement of the chatbots. For example, we've adapted it to increase for increased remote working as a result of the COVID crisis to guide around, to guide staff around remote services. And we're also looking into linking to other hospital information and management systems and how we're looking into how we can get more value from the chatbot text, particularly around staff issues and concerns. We're also investigating other potential health healthcare use cases, for example, a mental health chatbot. We're also looking into further use of natural language processing to process textual reports from doctors to aid clinical coding. In summary, the relationship between the Hartree Centre and Alder Hay has been very beneficial. SDFC Hartree Centre have the ability to develop exciting computing capabilities, but the real benefit comes from applying these in the real world and creating impact. The relationship with Alder Hay enables not only enables us not only to test out and develop the technical capabilities, but more importantly, to create worthwhile impact in providing smarter and more effective healthcare to children. Thank you. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Ian Senner. I'm a consultant, a respiratory paediatrician uh, here in Alderhey. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to work with the innovation team on a project uh, where we've been aiming to map health inequalities in children with asthma. Um, and um, I'm very honoured to be able to share some of that with you in this brief talk today. So firstly, by way of background, asthma is the commonest chronic condition of childhood. It affects over a million children in the UK and over 350 million children worldwide and, and are, there's a real urgency and a real need to improve outcomes for children with asthma. They die more frequently than they should and they're admitted to hospital more frequently than they should be. And one of the key problems that we've seen is that there's huge inequality around this. So looking around the United Kingdom, the map 
always looks the same. There are huge areas where there are quite high rates of hospitalisation and mortality and other areas where things are much better and, and, and the inequality between the two is rife. In Liverpool and in other parts of the North West, the outcomes for children with asthma have typically been very poor. We've got high rates of hospital admission. And one of the reasons for this, one of the key reasons for this, is socioeconomic deprivation. So the healthier you are as a child and the better you are at accessing care and, 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 and taking good care of yourself, the better your asthma will be. But a lot of children in socioeconomically deprived areas have got restricted opportunities to be healthy. So we need to start thinking a lot more creatively about how we use our health services around paediatric asthma. We need to start thinking how we can tailor what we do to empower children. And one of the things that we need to do is to focus our uh, efforts and our attentions in areas that could be better. And part of that involves looking at the environment and looking at air pollution and, and other problems that can make asthma worse. Part of it involves making sure that we're linking well with with primary care and with schools and with pharmacists in that area to make sure that we've got the health services set up exactly as they need to be for children. Uh, and part of it involves just making sure that we stick to guidelines of care and make sure that we're giving the best care possible. And that's what we were trying to do with this project. We were trying to map so that we could focus our inequalities. And we used routinely collected data to do our mapping. We've realised over the years, I think that data is, is, is so important to drive, the, to drive high standards of care. And, and, and we haven't really used data the way that we could be using it and the way that other industries are using it. So we use routinely collected data from our business intelligence services here to identify postcodes where there were high levels of morbidity in children. And you can see on this map here, and how that looks. And so it was almost like hotspots of, of, of areas. And from that, we were able to start to identify key parameters that needed to be changed. For example, things that could be done in primary care. And we're starting to see patterns in things like air pollution and antenatal health and other public health issues. So this is where we're at with the process so far. Um, We've needed uh, a lot of input and a lot of hard work from, from, from various uh, people, including people from the innovation team, particularly Holly, and people from the business intelligence uh, team, particularly Kevin and Chris. And we found that once we set up the processes, it was much easier to roll. Um, the difficulty comes with what happens next. As with all things in, in healthcare and certainly all things in innovation, the, the key thing is, well, so what? You know, what are you going to do with this? And our next step really is to feed this into a process of identifying high-risk children in high-risk areas and thinking through data-driven strategies to ensure that they get the best quality of care. So the project is relatively early in its, um, in its natural history. Um, we've identified that we can do this and we're identifying trends to show that it can work. One of the other problems that we find, as well as identifying the so what, is identifying how do you actually prove the so what? You know, what is the research strategy that you need around this? This won't last well or this won't lend itself well to a randomised control trial. We need to think of more um, uh, appropriate and, and responsive natural experiments to see how this goes. Uh, and that's really where we're moving to in the next field is, is looking, at, uh, looking at doing that research to identify uh, how well this works. But even though we're in our infancy with this project, um, as you'll see here, Holly has already won an award for this. This was a, a, a regional award for reducing health inequalities. And I think that goes to show that people are already starting to see the benefits of this approach. Hi, I'm Kevin Bell, I'm the Interim Associate Director of Data Insight and Automation at Holder Hay. Um, I just want to talk you through how we've been utilising Powerful Platform um, here with the help of the innovation team. So as you can imagine, um, like many organisations, uh, COVID-19 was a huge catalyst for change um, for us. 
Um, we were presenting a lot of new time critical challenges, um, which gave us actually a lot of new opportunities for new approaches. Um, you know, we've been talking about using the Power Platform Microsoft for um, quite some time. Um, we've been doing a few bits and pieces, but uh, this, the opportunities that this gave us were, were immense, so we, we really jumped on it quickly. Um, we started in rapid design and development, um, doing some apps within days, uh, weeks, uh, rather than months, and sort of more traditional development, and doing some real um, rapid deployment out into the organisation as well. The challenges were, were massive. Um, we had a a hospital essentially that you were used to working in one location um pretty much um and they all all of a sudden had to shift to remote working um so that was a big change uh, we had large data collections um that were required for external reporting and it added internal reporting activities as well that we need to coordinate with staff members um so there was a there was a, a lot of new challenges, um, which was really interesting. So one of the problems we obviously had to, had to solve um, was how in the pandemic did we both uh, well, um, you know, it was about three and a half thousand plus staff, and we wanted to make sure that they're well looked after. There was also the staff availability and planning for the organisation. Um, Act wants to give staff access to supportive tools and information for staff. Um, again, external reporting requirements, um, all of that had to be met. The um, journey into creating Team Track, um, our first real, real um, power app, um, took us 124 versions <laughs> um, released uh, to get that um, live. Um, very quick iterative development. But we sort of moved from the early stages. The project was uh, we you know tried Excel files to try and capture it, calling around people before um, the working day to find out where they'd be, and um, with huge teams doing that, um, all very very labour intensive. Um, so we quickly uh, decided we needed to do something else, um, and we moved to do Team Track, um, and that's the power app essentially it would allow us to get the individuals and staff members to um, record their availability for the next we normally ask for the next couple of weeks um offering the quick links through to staff help uh chat bots um etc so there was we built a lot of functionality into it very quickly and the great thing about this was it brought us uh, a framework to start working with. So we started off with, we need to capture some data from a user in, in Power Apps to, well, let's now do a dashboard. Um, so we did that and we pushed the data from the Power Apps into the dashboard. Um, we then decided well, we need to do all um, notifications. So we introduced Power Automate into that to start sending notifications to um, both the member of staff and to the wellbeing team as well to let them know that somebody had actually completed something in the app. Um, and then we, as a bit of a more of a bolt on, we started putting um, chatbot links in as well. Um, so we really became a one-stop shop um, for the staff. That was all deployed across multiple devices um, as well. We had to allow for mobile, tablet, desktop, um, etc. Um, we also looked at embedding it in Teams um, as well, and that all works really well. So the next app that we did on scale was the um, Flu app. Um, it was real e e evolution. Yeah, There's a lot of stuff we could reuse from TeamTrack because of the new framework we had developed. Um, same problem, paper, um, Excel files, people calling around is, was the normal way of doing the Flu campaign. Um, and we move that to Power App again. Same principles, we need, but we need to now collect consent um, from individuals. We have to book appointments, schedule appointments. Um, and we did all this w with a Power App, um, which, which was great. And it really, really is 
um, driven the compliance of the flu vaccination program um, re to a real high level now. So we now have a number of solutions. Um, you know, lateral, the latest one being lateral flow testing, um, which has allowed us to start looking at things like QR scanning, um, taking photos of test results, etc. So doing lots of things we couldn't have done and it's again spinning these out in, in weeks, really. Um, so it's been fan fantastic for the trust to start using the Power Platform. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Olufemi Olajide, and I'm the Senior Data Scientist for Aldo Hay Hospital. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the impact of data science within the healthcare, uh, what impact data science has, has, has had on us uh, in our trust. Uh, first of all, uh, data science, is, uh, we can simply define it as the using, using data science or using data to solve problems. Um, Considering the amount of data we have now, the amount of data we generate daily now, uh, it's massive and uh, it's best to make sure that, uh, to ensure that we actually use this data productively for the benefits of our patients. And that's what we have been doing in Aldo Hay, using all data that we have to be able to make the right decision and um, such that our, data, our patients are uh, properly um, managed. In a data science workflow, there are some things that need to be in place. First of all, you need to understand um, the business question. That's what, that's the first thing we do in all the hay. We try to sit down with the department or the project owner to try and understand what exactly they want to get out of this and see where we can support this service. So uh, we need to get the right data, um, the mod model the data, then communicate the results if that result is something that is actually what the business owner is also looking into or considering. Uh, then we then deploy and then manage, monitor this data, ensure that it continues to work as uh, into. Uh, before we came up with the uh, kind of project we can run, so we did like a process mapping of how our patients come into the trust. We know usually that uh, what will usually happen is uh, we'll probably provide them with um, an appointment or they come in via our ED. So these both ways we actually model. So if um, we have, if you're looking at a patient coming um, that we have given um, an appointment, the possible things that can come up from that is that the probability of patients not taking up that appointment, not coming. So we looked at um, predicting our patients not being brought to hospitals. Then we looked at our outpatient daily attendance predictions. And then if our patients are coming from ED, then we have a model that actually predicts the daily attendance of um, ED. Then we have a model that helps us to track these uh, ED attendances um, into serious or not serious cases. Um, that helps, that's a decision tool that helps clinicians. It can be like a second opinion, you know, when you're trying to understand, uh, when a clinician is trying to say, where, should, where is this patient best fit? And also a third one actually is the risk of admit, being admitted from ED. Then from there, we also developed a model that um, helps us to determine how long our patients are going to stay in hospital. That helps us to, um, that helps with our modeling of bed. So we know how many beds we need. Some of the other projects that we are uh, also looking into um, that I have not discussed, we've looked into medication errors. This is where we actually looked into our incident case reporting and then because this is actually free text and it's actually it is a rich data that prior to data science it cannot be evaluated and um, because of the amount of um, text it, we don't have the capacity for any human being to be stationed to do this so developed models using the natural language processing where we 
through the incident reporting and bring out themes, common themes that we can now discuss with clinicians where they can look into. And that has helped them to be able to um, address if there are common themes what, um, to make sure that things are put in place that um, to prevent medication errors. We have also developed a model that helps us to risk our patients uh, regarding development of uh, hospital acquired infections. So that has uh, uh, the potential of um, managing our patients properly, also reducing the amount of antimicrobials that we provide, and making sure that the right people get the right kind of treatment. And also, finally, we are currently working on developing the um, length of stay our patients um, uh, stay in hospital. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope uh, with this we will be able to encourage hospitals to take more of data science within your trust to be able to experience the good impact data science can have within hospitals. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sharif Hosni, Innovation Consultant at Older Hay. One of the projects I work on is Older Play. Older Play is Older Hay's patient experience platform funded by Older Hay Children's Charity. It's been successfully deployed within the Trust since October 2018. The purpose of the app was to give children and young people a digital tool to familiarise, distract and reward. Everything we do relating to Older Play comes back to those three themes. We're continually iterating to make Older Play fresh and relevant. One such iteration has been its transformation from a standalone native app to a versatile web platform, and this allows us to add, update, and modify content onto Older Play. Going to hospital can be an experience filled with anxieties and worries, particularly for children. Therefore, through Older Play, we wanted to ensure that patients can familiarise themselves with the hospital environment and particular procedures that they may be having. Older Play has an explore section. This is where a range of the main areas of the hospital are shown in 360 degree images. And this allows patients to see what the area they're going to will look like, giving them more control and more knowledge on what they can expect when preparing for their hospital visit. This has also been really useful for parents as well. Older Play also has a watch and learn section, and this is where videos of particular procedures are hosted. These videos show patients explaining what it's like for them to have that particular procedure, such as a blood test or an x-ray. They talk openly about how long it takes, what they had to do, and it enables them to gain a degree of reassurance from patients who have experienced the same thing. One of the overriding objectives of Older Play is to improve children's hospital experience by enabling staff to reward patients for bravery. They do so by providing them with something meaningful and special. To do this, Older Play uses its unique Forever stickers. This enables patients to receive a sticker from a member of staff at a clinic, and then once scanned, these stickers are brought to life using augmented reality. And what's more, they can also be added to their bank of collected stickers to reward their courage. This is a form of gamification that's been really effective. Older Play acts as a tool to make Older Hate a positive and fun experience for patients. In addition to the rewards and familiarisation, distraction is also achieved through games and videos. Through our evaluations, we've found that Older Play has had a hugely positive effect on the children and young people in reducing anxiety, and that this in turn has made procedures less stressful for them and more manageable for clinicians. Because of the autonomy that we have over the CMS of the system, the sky's the limit in terms of the content that can be included. We're really excited about the future of Older Play and enhancing interactivity, gamification and personalisation, whilst ensuring that everything comes back to its guiding principles of familiarisation, distraction and reward. Hi, my name is Chantel and I work as one of the UX UI designers within the design team at Mindwave. I'm going to take you through a very brief overview about who we are and what we've been working on with Older Hay. 
So just some background on us. Uh, MindWave was born out of the Biomedical Research Centre at the Morsley. Um, we design and develop digital product, products and services um, that have a positive impact on people and work with healthcare, academia, startups and charities. Um, Fortress develop products that help organisations with the demands of data, um, with the focus being on efficient, uh, simplicity, uh, secure and intuitive. Um, they have a good understanding of uh, and relationship with trust across the UK and other digital partners. So in this instance, they connected us with Alderhey in the knowledge that we could provide an effective and efficient solution for the Older Play platform. The project was handed to us with uh, the aim to transform Older Play into a new and improved um, accessible experience through the evolution of design and expansion on the original platform. Um, and there were some goals specific, um, so building on existing content and characters, um, bringing them to life, um, making them more interactive and dynamic, um, so games, more videos, utilising and improving on interactivity, so um, building on what's already been um, built and plugging in new interactive experiences and expanding on all areas. Um, so an extensive expansion um, that allows additional content um, to be put onto the platform by admin staff. So this is just a, a look at our approach um, based on the Design Council double diamond approach. Um, it just begins with a broad thinking, so a lot of research and empathy into understanding the broader context of the problem, um, the who, the what, the why, um, and then from that narrowing down and establishing and pinpointing exactly um, what it is we need to do to resolve the problem. And once we've established that, we broaden out again. Um, so this involves a lot of ideation, a lot of prototyping and back and forth. Um, we do this as, as much as possible so that from there we can further validate and narrow back down onto the specifics of what the best solution is. So Play Canvas is another digital partner involved in the project who are at the forefront of browser gaming technology. Um, and they allow users to access platforms using browser-based interfaces, so without the need for downloading apps. Um, and with this innovation, they've been integral to the expansion of the older play platform um, and allowing it to be accessible by browser, which is um, really important because we want um, more children to have access to the platform um, as many as possible. So this, um, alongside the older play work, we have um, a wider vision working with Older Hay and its digital front door. So this is a visual representation or metaphor um, encompassing all aspects of what um, the digital front door for Older Hay looks like and how it could work. Um, so just addressing all the functionalities that would, um, need, we would need to in integrate, um, the development and design requirements and how they sit together. Um, and having a shared uh, innovative vision across the platform just also helps uh, the wider team who um, will not all be as digitally focused understand the, the process and the aim. So just looking at what specifics um, we have achieved so far and, and what we are planning for the future. So I touched on um, accessibility. Um, so the more accessible, the more people, the more children can engage and benefit from the platform. Um, and moving it onto a um, browser allows for that. More security, so there is now a sign up um, and login um, functionality on the platform. So that allows users to kind of set up, save accounts, save their progress, um, and just encourages them to use it more. Um, and personalization, so another incentivization for users to, to use um, older play. So um, custom skins, um, using nicknames um, 
and just uh, allowing a more personal experience. And the future. Um, so we're currently working on um, chatbot or incorporating a chatbot function. Um, so allowing the user to interact, ask questions and navigate around the platform better. Um, Additional resources, so more specifically, updating the learn section of the platform to watch and learn um, and adding a lot more videos. And CMS functionality, so, um, um, and also um, Hasbro content. So setting up secure video access of um, Hasbro content so that it works within the, the hospital um, Wi-Fi when a user scans um, an interactive sticker, for example. Um, so, yeah, we hope to continue working with innovative future thinking trusts like Older Hay um, and companies like Fortress with whom we have a shared vision so we can improve uh, the life of patients and service users. Hi again. Um... This is one of my pet projects that I really enjoyed during the code thing. Um, was around materials and material science. And we found lots of different things out while we were going through the thing. But one thing which was interesting was how copper, um, how COVID really doesn't like copper at all. Now, there are lots of different potential mechanisms for how copper uh, can actually kill the virus. But it's been shown that the half-life of COVID on copper is something like two or three hours compared to in some other surfaces up to 24 to 48 hours. Now, the thing I find fascinating is that we like to think this is fancy and new technology, but it's not. If you look back all the way through history, copper has been used as an antiviral, antimicrobial surface for thousands of years. If you just got a look at the old copper kettles, because people knew they had a copper kettle or you carried water around in a copper uh, vessel, then your chances of getting a nasty bug were, were a lot less. So uh, in the outbreak, there was this option of what if we could use copper on some of the materials and surfaces around the hospital uh, to try and make it more virucidal. Um, and what we found was that there was a local company uh, who could create these nano coatings, so incredibly thin coatings of copper, um, which could be applied to almost any object. And we were you know, really interested in thinking, right, okay, how can we get involved? How can we see if this new process, which for applying these really thin layers, uh, could be used in a hospital? So we did some really early stage trials. And I can show you some of the things which we made. Um, now, one of the things that made me really sad about um, the whole COVID crisis was that we couldn't, you know, no, we normally have toys out, but obviously we couldn't do it. So I thought, well, can we copper coat toys? Uh, so I'm just going to show you a quick video now of us copper coating um, uh, this helicopter. Here we go. So okay, so this is you know a copper coated helicopter. Uh, so now it has completely antiviral surfaces all the way around. Uh, also, um, you may have noticed that the Star Wars theme. Um, we did a copper coated Chewbacca. Um, now I don't know if you can see the Chewbacca looks a little bit metallic. Yeah, we, we kind of overdid it slightly um, on the on the on the copper Chewbacca, um, but amazingly, if you get the right formulation, it can be completely see through. So these are just some PPE. So we're thinking, you know, the, the trouble is, is like cleaning PPE all the time, really harsh chemicals. Could you make the surfaces a bit less uh, conducive to viruses staying on them? So that's a, a copper coated set of goggles. I can even do it to um, fabrics. Now this is you know the, the old hay mask which there is another talk about uh, which we created. Now our, our old hay mask is antiviral coated, not with copper though, but this one here is one of our experimental uh, copper coated masks. Uh, so that stays antiviral and antibacterial as well. I did lots of things like uh, touch screens and phones, uh, tablets, because obviously these things apparently are dirtier than your toilet. Um, and for those of you who listen to the distancer talk as well, they even blinged up one of the distancers, fully copper coated as well, and, and mine has a, has a copper handle. But material science really is fascinating. You never really fully appreciate um, just the breadth of tech which is out there, which is built into the materials which we interact with every day. And the thing that my take home from this is that now material science is one of my areas of focus. And we're like, okay, how can we make 
a surface or material, the thing that our um, that our uh, you know, operative instrument made of, how can we make it do its job better? It's not just about its form and its function and the cool digital tech which is built into it. It's kind of its actual very physical substance have an effect. So an example is that um, you know eyewear was very important at the start of COVID. Um, we quickly found that these actually aren't completely clear. They're only about 73% clear, uh, your standard polycarbonate uh, set of glasses. Um, and we did lots of looking around and then you said clear is a very subjective term. So look at these. So this is clear. So for PPE eyewear. And you see the difference between this and this. Um, I can tell you, you can notice the difference when you're operating. So material science, one of my take homes from um, from the COVID crisis is we should be questioning what uh, the environment is made from, what our kit's made from, uh, and it's definitely for me going to be an area of, uh, of exploration. Hello, my name is Roland Partridge. I'm a consultant paediatric and neonatal surgeon and a member of the innovation team here in Alder Hay. Now, this talk is going to be a little bit different and I'm going to gradually take what I'm wearing off, but don't worry, not, not all of it. It's a tale of three products and the four ways in which they've helped the hospital and the UK more widely. So as, as promised, I'm going to take that off because uh, it is a little bit harder to hear when I'm wearing it. The journey started in late March when the hospital here, as most other places in the UK, had an acute shortage of PPE, including full face visors. I contacted a company that I'd worked with previously who I knew had plastic manufacturing capacity. And over the course of a week, we developed a very simple, reusable, washable product. The original phone call was, I think, at four o'clock on the Monday. And by lunchtime on the Friday, we had the first batch of 300 of these arrived. And ultimately, the hospital has used 20,000 of these over the ensuing months. It was a really interesting process at that time. Companies SMEs were incredibly keen to work with and for the NHS. And so this product was developed with no upfront costs or development fees. That was all absorbed by the, the SME. They were prepared to do this because they, they wanted to help out. It was interesting in that the cost of plastics at that time fluctuated hugely. This is made of PETG and polycarbonate. And the price of that in April compared to March was increased by a factor of about five. But the company produced it at the, the, the cost that they'd initially quoted in, in late March. And so whilst Alder Hay, we, we have a focus here on really trying to get some degree of financial return for our intellectual property and, and, and effort. We didn't receive a financial benefit from this monetary benefit. But what we did do is we had a product that was much needed at a challenging time at a static and stable cost with no upfront development fee. This led, though, to the next product, which is which is this hooded visor. Now, it's not really a hood as we've come to know them. It's a visor plus. It's a visor that gives a little bit more protection to the hair and the neck. Say if you're taking blood from a child who's coughing and sneezing, it provides you with just a little bit more protection than just a face visor. It's not a replacement for a hood, a formal hood with a venting system. You have to wear an FFP3 mask and things under this, um, but it does just give you that little bit that little bit extra protection. The other benefit of the time spent developing that hood was that it put us in touch with the clothing manufacturing capacity within the UK that led to this, this, this gown. And this gown is a really interesting sort of story of open book development between tens of different companies and institutions, a number of different universities and design houses around the UK, a number of different hospitals, a number of different factories, all have had some input into this gown. It's in the advanced stages of being readied by, by two UK manufacturers with the aim of providing a fully UK manufactured gown to help achieve the government's target of the vast majority of our PPE for the next few years being made on these shores. I mentioned earlier our drive in Alder Hay to receive return for intellectual property and, and design input to products. Now, this is a really interesting one in that because it's
been done in such an open book manner with so many different people contributing, it's virtually impossible to actually track down every different department, every different university's individual contribution to this. But the aim is that the benefit may not be directly financial in return to us, but a wider benefit to society, to the United Kingdom, in terms of having quality products, securing supply chains, securing jobs, uh, and maintaining our PPE independence for uh, the next months and years going forwards. The fourth way in which this design process has benefited us is actually the face mask that you may have seen in my other talk earlier in the conference. It was our contact with clothing manufacturers through the hood and then the gown that led to our relationship with the industrial partner who ultimately ended up producing the face mask, the brilliant mask, which has been a great success. And that has yielded financial returns into Alder Hay. So I think my learning points from this would be stay hungry, keep pushing doors, start with something simple, be open, talk to people, accept people's help. My philosophy is you don't always have to have the clear end point, certainly not a clear financial end point when you start a project or start working collaboratively with industry, but you push doors, you see what happens, and sometimes you might start with a very simple piece of plastic that might evolve. You put in contact with material manufacturers who then develop a gown with, and ultimately you might end up with something like the brilliantmasks.com that will provide a financial return for your institution. So I hope that's been an inspiring little whistletop store of that journey. Uh, thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Henry Pinchbeck, CEO of 3D Live Prints. And I'm going to give you a quick introduction to our company and also our special relationship with Alder Hay Children's Hospital. Now, 3D Life Prints is a medical 3D printing company, which means we design and manufacture patient-specific, uh, custom-made medical devices. That would include anatomical models, which are simply a copy of a patient's anatomy, cutting guides which are used by surgeons during surgery, and patient-specific implants. Now, 3D Life Prints was formed back in 2015 and actually we were a founding member of the Alder Hay uh, Innovation Hub. So we very much followed the template that we set up at Alder Hay with the rest of our business. So what we do is we set up our facility within a hospital, which is exactly what we did at Alder Hay, where we have some staffing, some hardware and some software within that hospital. And that allows us to provide our services at something that we call the point of care. Back to one of my colleagues to tell you all about our relationship with Alder Hay and the work that we've done there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Roberts and I'm the Business Development and Project Manager for 3D Life Prints. Our embedded hub here at Alder Hay is actually our flagship hub, which we opened up in 2015. Uh, what began as a relationship with two surgeons who had a big interest in health tech innovation and 3D printing to help their cases, has grown into us having a permanent residency here at the Hospitals Innovation Centre. Five years later, now in 2020, uh, we're now supporting all kinds of surgeons and clinicians across the hospital from different fields. We work with Alder Hay because they're committed to applying health technology to improve patient outcomes and the entire healthcare system on a regular basis. There's a whole innovation team here committed to doing just that. Alder Hay want to stay among the best in the world uh, when it comes to children's care and we want to help them do that by supplying our 3D printing services. Here in the underground bunker, the innovation centre, or the back cave as some people call it, uh, we've got our space to work on site. Uh, our printers are here and so is our biomedical engineer, more importantly, who is the real talent behind the devices we supply. Being here, we're immediately available to clinicians and surgeons as a result. Uh, sometimes urgently available uh, when complex or life-threatening cases come through and they need that additional insight that uh, 3D visualisation and haptics can provide. Sometimes when they need certainty in surgery, we can also provide things like cutting and drilling guides. Being here also helps us support the more adventurous uh, among the staff who want to explore new procedural techniques or research ideas. And in situations like the COVID pandemic, uh, which has happened over the last year, we can look at easing new challenges that arise. For me, I'm passionate about getting this technology in front of as many people as we can. Uh, those who can benefit from it, the 
clinicians and surgeons because then that knocks on to the patients who will really benefit. Especially in some cases when what first seems impossible is opened up by what we can provide, whether that's through insights from visualization or through uh, confidence in surgery from our guides. Hi, my name is David Collins and I run 3D Life Prints, embedded 3D printing facility at Old Hay Children's Hospital. Based in the hospital's innovation hub, our unique business model places engineers such as myself and 3D technologies on site to provide medical 3D printing services at the point of care. In doing so, we can find effective solutions to clinical problems by combining my background in engineering and science with the world-class medical expertise and knowledge of the hospital's clinicians and innovation team. Much of our work here is driven by needs in the medical and surgical care of children and we aim to meet these needs by utilising 3D technologies to develop and manufacture on-site personalised medical devices, often in response to complex cases. These personalised medical devices take many forms but often fall into three categories. These are patient-specific anatomical models, patient-specific surgical guides and patient-specific implants all of which use patient anatomy as their foundations. They aim to aid the pre-surgical planning process, help surgeons in theatre and ultimately improve patient outcomes. To give you an example of how these different devices work, well, our patient-specific anatomical models, they act as visual aids for the surgeon so they can really understand the patient's complex condition and by printing these in tissue-like materials, it also offers them the chance to simulate surgery prior to theatre. In addition, our patient-specific surgical guides and implants, well, they're designed to fit exactly on a patient's anatomy and also predefine the cutting and drilling vectors they're going to use in theatre. Through these personalised medical devices, we work across the full range of disciplines, including orthopaedics, cardiology, oncology, general surgery and beyond. And we also use 3D printing here to create medical imaging phantoms and simulation models for medical research, education and training. These models often detail normal or complex pathologies and really give medical professionals a chance to familiarise themselves with difficult conditions, procedures or protocols. Many of our projects begin life here when clinicians approach us in our hub with challenges they are facing in their clinical practice. But by being on site and working alongside clinicians daily, we are also sometimes able to preempt and offer solutions to some of these challenges too. Either way, we need to solve these challenges in a collaborative way using short iterative cycles and quick turnaround times which can actually be really beneficial for urgent projects requiring a rapid response. And I'm pleased to report there have been many positive outcomes for both surgeons and patients as a result of these collaborative efforts. The most rewarding part of my job is helping to empower clinicians, do the things that they need to do and working with them to improve the lives of children in their care the latter being something I'm very passionate about. 3D printing inherently lends itself to complexity and as such is a really innovative space and I'm privileged to be at the forefront of using this technology in Old Age Children's Hospital to improve paediatric care and outcomes. So that concludes our talk, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you do have any questions or you're interested in our work then please feel free to reach out to myself or Paul who are around for the rest of the day or you can contact us using the information on the slide here. Thank you very much. Uh, right, so, hi, uh, my name is Ian Hennessy. I'm the Clinical Director of Innovation here and also one of the paediatric surgeons. And I'm going to be speaking to you uh, about some of the work of the Rapid Prototyping Centre, which is a place that I'm standing in uh, right now. But instead of uh, talking to you about all of the amazing and cool things we've done, uh, I thought it'd be better to talk about some of the failures and uh, some of the things that didn't work, because that's the nature of innovation. Uh, it's not all about things working every single time. In fact, it's actually about the majority of our ideas um, not being rubbish, uh, but maybe not being the right thing. Maybe they were addressing a problem that wasn't there. Uh, maybe they just don't work. Maybe they're dangerous. Um, so these are all things which you have to, you know, you have to embrace as part of the innovative process. And this really got, you know, brought home to me. And my first ever innovation project was a complete disaster. It didn't work. Um, 
and it was a shame because I had such high hopes for it. It was this project and it was about putting these telehealth things in children's homes um, and they'd be able to avoid going to their GP, they'd be able to communicate direct to the hospital, um, we would have all this sampling and testing done in the comfort of their own home, uh, great bits of technology, CE Mark technology, we'd put it all out to them and then it fell apart because I hadn't actually engaged all the stakeholders properly and hadn't engaged the clinical teams properly and they didn't want to use it. Um, so even although the patients loved it, we had to withdraw the service. And I felt terrible because I just, you know, although I thought it was a great solution, uh, I hadn't thought it through properly. So uh, I learned an awful lot from that failure and I'm hoping that by talking through some of these failures, um, it will encourage you to learn from uh, failures too. So, um, so this is the picture, you know, of our rapid prototyping centre uh, taken at the height of COVID when we were really knocking out quite a lot of prototypes. In fact, over the period we knocked out 32 prototypes, um, eight of which actually got deployed, three of which got commercialised, they were the successes. I'm going to talk about the majority of the failures and things that were, were parked. Um, so here's one of my favourites. Um, there was one of the problems we were having uh, was around uh, FP3 face masks. Uh, how could we have uh, you know, filtered air coming to our face? And the problem with FP3 face masks was that um, you couldn't see your mouth move. So we were trying to come up with a clear solution, a way that you could see through the face masks, so you could see people's faces that were talking, and it would make communication better. Um, so I thought, um, what if you could connect uh, a filtered air source, that's one of our PAPR um, uh, air supplies uh, for with the hoods that we used to have. What if I could just apply it directly to your face and you could have a jet of, of fresh filtered air? And this is me uh, in the, after having you know, knocked it together, um, in the lab testing on our protocol machine, which is how we test our FFP3 masks. Now, I'd had this brilliant idea that to get around the problem of when I took a deep breath in of sucking unfiltered air around the edges of the masks, I would put this reservoir bag on, uh, so they see that green thing, uh, put the reservoir bag on and then when I, uh, I take a deep breath in it would add an extra bit of um, uh, air so it would stop me from entraining from the sides. However, what it was actually doing was pulling carbon dioxide, which meant, um, you can see I'm looking a bit giddy in that picture, I think that's because I was a little bit hypoxic. <laughs> so, good thing that we didn't use that and that got binned as being bad. And uh, when I showed it to the anaesthetists, they were like, well, you know, we probably could have told you that. But anyway, so that was a, that was an interesting uh, failure of mine. Um, uh, here's another one. This is me in one of the, the Papper air hoods. And one of the problems that we had was uh, when you're in these air hoods, um, you can't hear very well because that thing's blasting air down the front. Um, and we thought, right, okay, could we create some kind of throat mic setup? Uh, could we have earphones so that I could speak to the persons in front of me and it would uh, relay the, um, the, the sound waves. Um, and, and then we thought, we can't have things in our ears all the time because you want to be able to hear. So we thought, right, shall we use these bone conduction earphones? And when we're in theatre, um, we'll have the bone conduction and that will leave your ear open and the sound will just get vibrated straight in through the, you know, the hard bones in the side of your head. And uh, so we got a load of these. And we started testing them in a simulated setup, in a simulated theatre. And um, what it transpires is that Bluetooth has a lot of uh, latency and lag in it because of the way that things get compressed. Um, and then I've got another system which would theoretically have got rid of that latency and lag, but it didn't. Um, and what would happen is when my mouth would move about maybe a second later, the, the sound would, would come through to the other person. So it was really, really off-putting and really distracting. Um, so it got, it, it got binned. I actually believe that someone has solved this. Uh, I've heard that there's a Formula 1 racing team that seems to have got a solution to this, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but we had to park this and bin it. Um, uh, there's another one. Um, I was getting really annoyed uh, when I was operating because I was really thirsty and I couldn't take my FP3 mask off. Um, so I tried to create a valve in the mask uh, that would allow me to drink. Uh, so that's like a tube going through. The thing with this though is that actually you completely invalidate all the warranties and there's no way you're going to get this past medical devices people. Um, so we, we binned that. Uh, it was an interesting thought at the time and it was quite fun but never got used in, a, in real life. 
Um, we thought about how can we had a big problem with them. We couldn't measure kids anymore because they weren't coming to the hospital. So we thought, could we use some of the LiDAR that's built into some of the new tablets to measure their height? And we did this and we did a really quick um, evaluation trial uh, with members of staff um, and it wasn't accurate enough. Don't be worried about it. Killed it quick. That's the, that's the important thing. And I'm sure it will actually come of use in the future, but for a quick, you know, fixed our problem, uh, it didn't. So we, we did a very quick evaluate of trial with our research guys and got rid of it. So that was, uh, that was good fun. Here's another one. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is actually a nuclear um, suit that we got from the nuclear industry um, when we were trying to create uh, you know, isolation suits. And um, <laughs> I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could get a, a tube and just have it coming in the back um, and we could, you know, could fire uh, clean air into the suit itself rather than just the hood. Um, well, apart from the fact we wouldn't go to the medical devices regulation thing, is it, it caused the suit to blow up, so it was like a Michelin man walking around, so it just, uh, yeah, that was really silly as well. Um, this was another one, um, because at the start we were really convinced that we were going to be overrun with not having enough oxygen points. So we came up with this 3D printed, you know, in partnership with 3D Life Prints who are on site, 3D printers, oxygen splitter. And it's one of our respiratory team came up with it. Um, so that for every um, oxygen point in the hospital, we could turn it into three oxygen points. Now, the thing that was really interesting with this is we did all of this. We actually got it through the fast track um, uh, sign off for a medical device. So it was really good that we managed to get all that done. And then, and only then, really did we have a properly good discussion with our um, our medical engineering department who said we had 710 oxygen points in the hospital which could be run at 400% of our ma maximum capacity of people that could be in the hospital. So this wasn't a problem at all. <laughs> so someone else might want to use it, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the best thing for us. Um, so this is the thing, you know, I've, I've talked about a lot of failures there, um, and this is one which I actually thought was a failure. Um, we created thermal moulded masks, so masks that could be made at an incredibly high rate, so we, would, uh, make, we could make 90,000 of these per day. It's basically like an Easter egg type uh, wrapping type, uh, type thing. Um, but when we rolled them out, people weren't really sure how to use them, um, so the uptake wasn't great. And we ended up just using the normal, you know, old-fashioned visors. Um, but then what we found out, and I've only just found out, because I had actually parked this for a bit. What we found out uh, was that uh, the kids love this mask. It looks like a stormtrooper mask. So the kids are now, when they come in speech and language, this is the visor that they get given. Um, so although I initially thought it was a failure and I had parked it, uh, it actually turned out to be, to be a win. Um, so that was a, a nice little thing. So that's a little kind of walk through some of the, the failures that have happened over um, the past eight or nine months. Um, yeah, you, you learn a lot from these things, but I think the key thing that I've learned over this time is that failures are absolutely not a bad thing. Absolutely not a bad thing. In fact, if you're not having any failures, then you're not doing it right. And you should be having more failures than successes. Um, and that, I've, I've got more failures I could go through if we, if we had more time for the talk. But, um, it's, it's just keep on throwing it out there. And one of the things I like about paediatrics, and I think why it's a good and fertile ground for innovation, is because we're used to looking a bit silly, because we'll, you know, we'll monkey around for the kids and you know, we'll get on our knees and you know, we'll draw faces on them and stuff. So we're not as, I don't know, maybe not as precious about making a mistake. And that's why I like working with children, because um, they've still got that mindset, and it's why I think they're natural innovators. Um, so, all I'm saying is celebrate your mistakes, learn from your mistakes, um, and, and view them just as part of the process. Thanks, I look forward to speaking to, and answering any questions you have on the chat.
Hello, I'm Phil Jennings, the Chief Executive of the Innovation Agency. The Innovation Agency is part of the National AHSN Network and we're the innovation arm of the NHS. We help organisations to identify and adopt the best healthcare solutions and we support innovators with great products. The innovators we support may be clinicians, businesses, charities or social enterprises. It's our role to make sure that the best innovations get the help and the support that they need and for us to introduce them to health and care providers. At Alder Hay Children's Hospital, we've been involved in a range of different ways. In fact, most of our teams at the Innovation Agency have worked or are working with Alder Hay. They are a fantastically ambitious, innovative hospital trust, and we're always excited to be part of their strategy, helping to build a better future for children and young people using digital tech and innovations. Now, in our early days, we gave funding to 10 innovation hubs throughout the Northwest Coast region. And one of those was Alder Hay, which at the time was building its new hospital in the park. It's really gratifying now to visit the innovation hub at Alder Hay, which our funding helped to set up. It was originally nicknamed the Bat Cave, and you can still see the odd image of a bat there as a reminder of its humble beginnings in the basement of the hospital. We also part funded the Hospitals Institute in the Park, which is a great conference and learning centre. I myself worked at Alder Hay quite some time ago now. Uh, I was a junior doctor in the original hospital uh, in the A&E department. So when I visit now, um, it's really breathtaking to see what Alder Hay has become. It's a real asset, not just for the city, but the region and indeed the country. And we at the Innovation Agency are very proud to be one of their partners. Our most recent involvement with Alder Hay has been to develop a system using an online portal which links NHS trusts with prospective commercial suppliers. This started at the outset of the pandemic when the team at the Innovation Agency offered to act as a contact point for suppliers on behalf of the region's trusts who were being bombarded with offers of support, largely around PPE, and they simply didn't have the capacity to respond and check out all the different offers. Our work led to a collaboration with Alder Hay and the Cheshire and Merseyside Healthcare Partnership to create a COVID-19 supply response team. This used Alder Hay's existing platform for innovations and collated and assessed all the offers, matching them to the needs of the trust. There are some brilliant entrepreneurs, clinicians and businesses working at Alder Hay on products which are absolutely transforming the lives of patients. We've been supporting some of these, whether that's through an initial introduction to the hospital or ongoing help with funding bids, evaluation, connections with the wider NHS and AHSN network and the various schemes that exist within the NHS to help health innovators, such as the clinical entrepreneurs, the NHS Innovation Accelerator and funds like SBRI Healthcare and Innovate UK. An example is 3D Life Prints, who print 3D anatomical models from scans, enabling teams to plan better for surgery. Later in this event, you'll be hearing from Alder Hay surgeon Joe Minford, who carried out an operation on a six-year-old girl to remove what's described as the impossible tumour. That operation only happened because the surgical team had the benefit of examining a 3D tumour model. Without it, they didn't think there was any chance of success. It's very difficult to evaluate the benefits of creating 3D prints of body parts before surgery, which means it's hard for a company to present a compelling business case. It's the sort of barrier that often stops or slows down innovation. The request for evaluation and evidence, which while it's good practice, can always not be that simple to achieve. It's our role at the Innovation Agency to help a company with a great product or service to overcome any barriers. And we've supported 3D Life Prints since they set up their base at the Innovation Hub. We introduced innovation leaders from other organisations to the company, 
when we organised a visit to the Innovation Hub from our community of Innovation Scouts. They met engineers who were producing the 3D models and they heard about the difference they were making to both surgeons and patients. And that led directly to 3D printing expanding throughout Liverpool to the Heart and Chest Hospital and also to the Royal Hospital with the help of a grant from ourselves, which was match funded by those hospitals. So finally, as anyone in the NHS will tell you, fantastic tech and digital innovation on its own can't improve healthcare. It's the people using it that will make the difference to patients. At Alder Hay, we know they have both the tech and the people to deliver fantastic care, and we are proud to be their partner. My name's David Powell and I'm the Development Director at Alder Hay and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the development of the Innovation Hub, um, how we started the service and where we came from. So this goes back to uh, early days in 2012. Um, my job coming to Alder Hay was to develop the new, uh, the new hospital and as part of that endeavour we were talking to lots of the staff and patients about what they wanted and what opportunity they saw with the new hospital. And as part of those conversations, uh, Mick Barnes, one of the radiologists at Alder Hay, uh, came to see us and said, well, he's had this idea with his daughter, Eve, about um, bringing a digital friend into Alder Hay and what benefits of that might bring in terms of um, making children feel more comfortable in the environment and trying to reward children for um, compliance and, and, and uh, fitting in with the system and the services as they came, etc. So, so that was the initial conversation and with that we thought that was a really cool idea and we decided we would launch an innovation uh, competition. So we launched a competition to find an innovation partner to work with Alder Hay to develop this idea from Nick and Neve, but also to look at what else we might do with the opportunity to innovate as we develop the new hospital. So that was um, I suppose a, an example of how 
all the hay works in a way because it's this this um, innovation system is is a cultural thing which came out about because all the hay has that inquisitive um, inquisitive mind and is able to move quite fluidly in my opinion to um, to think about new ideas so with the backing of the board we then launched the competition we had a lot of interest a lot of the big players came to work with us and we showed them Nick's idea and everyone got very interested in it, in it and we awarded a winner which was BT and they put some investment into the service so they put some investment to back it and for a year or so we worked with BT uh, developing the idea what that allowed us to do was to create a team so we created a team which uh, started off with uh, Ian Hennessy uh, one of the uh, surgeons who became the clinical director of the service and then we started to grow um, a small team around Ian and with that small team, we then started to uh, reach out and to explore who else was out there, what they might want to do with the opportunity to work with Alder Hay. And all kinds of people started coming to our door uh, with ideas. So that was extremely interesting in its own right. We then started to uh, develop it internally. So started to think about how we might grow it internally and started to find some really interesting uh, individuals in Alder Hay. So, uh, for example, uh, Rafa, one of the cardiac surgeons, I was chatting to him in the gym and he's, he had this great idea around um, use of sense technology and became involved, therefore, in the, in the very early days of the creation of the, of the hub. And what Rafa then did was put us on to um, Boston kids and so that, well, he had a colleague there who was, um, who was able to talk to us about how they developed their service there. So a, a deputation from us went to, to talk to Boston kids and we were struck by how open their system was and how they were opening up their system to anyone who wanted to come in and develop an idea. So it was an open source system, not very rules based, so it had this idea of being able to um, uh, stimulate creativity without too many barriers. And so we took that idea and, and uh, started to work with that. The next uh, uh, happy circumstance was that uh, in building the hospital we were, um, we were on our way to um, completion when walking around the hospital with the project director from the builder, uh, Lang, we found this um, big empty space. He had a guy sawing wood um, next to the theatres and I asked him what that was and he said, well, it's leftover space. We were going to put plants in it, but uh, it's no longer needed. So, so we had a conversation about whether or not we might be able to use it as a, an innovation hub. And so that was the first happy circumstance. And then the second one, one was the... Um, the builder needed some help with us as the project started to come to completion. So we did a deal with the builder whereby they fitted it out to a basic um, industrial um, setting. So it had industrial aesthetics to it, but it was something that we quite like, uh, quite like the idea of, something that um, had this idea, this feel of something um, new and um, industrial and sort of botany. So we created the hub with the help of the builder. So that when we opened the hospital, we had this big space of a thousand square metres, which we called the Bat Cave underneath the park, underneath the hospital, which we could then put the team into. And once we were up and running with the back cave and we had, um, we had our home, we then started to um, build on some of the ideas we had earlier on. So um, we had, I remember, a Chinese meal with Nick and with Ian, uh, where we were talking about how we were going to do it in order hey, And we had this, again, this idea of, of fluidity. So something whereby we could go out into the organisation harvest ideas, not have barriers, not say no. So this idea of not saying no, but to put things into the system whereby we could then find a way of getting those ideas pushed out into, into the world. So that was one idea. And then the second thing was we thought, well, talking to Rafa about what Boston did is we needed to have um, the outside world come to us. So we needed a way of bringing the outside world to us so that we could then do things with the ideas. So we ran a hackathon, um, one of these um, hackathon uh, Enterprise, which we, I didn't know about, I didn't know what it was, but where we um, got loads of people from inside the hospital and loads of people from outside the hospital. We got it facilitated by uh, by Boston, and then we were able to put together um, ideas with people who were, were interested in the ideas to create um, sort of first stage inventions or, or potential inventions, and that brought this idea of um, of can do and an opportunity. So it was very interesting uh, doing that. We we we've run three of those. Four of those now actually those big big type um, big type events we had help from the innovation agency were very helpful to us in the early days they helped put some money in to fit out the back cave but also to connect us up with um, with partners and use their networks to help us um, uh, piece together a, a network of, of um, 
ideas and participants. And so that started to build this, um, this, this connectivity. And Ian, who's our clinical director, and Rafa uh, had, had quite a lot of connections, a natural way of working, whereby they'd be out and about, pulling in connections, pulling in companies, pulling in universities, people outside of interest. And so we were able to build quite quickly uh, a network of, of ideas, opportunities. And what that meant is if, if a member of staff had an idea or a patient had an idea and they were presenting the idea, we had somewhere to place it, which is one of the most difficult things, I think, is trying to find somewhere where, um, where the idea could get placed. So we, we had this sort of system whereby um, ideas were being created and then we're starting to be placed with partners in this open source system. And then the next stage of development was bringing in, um, um, we had Emma and Claire and Rachel and some of the guys from the organization who had a um, with, with, with commercial or financial uh, background or uh, a more professional innovation background coming in there to try and turn that, um, what was a, a very loose opportunity and a loose idea into a system. Um, so that, that then became systemized and uh, it was then taken on to the next level. So what the guys then have been doing um, has been taking that sort of very early um, sort of um, fishing in the pond type idea into a, a big systemic event, endeavor whereby um, the innovation culture is being spread throughout all the hay in the organization, but is also being um, spread out outside in, into, into, the, into the wider world with the idea being that the more partnerships you can develop, the more networks, the more individuals, the more people you can get to contribute, um, then obviously the thing grows. And it's trying to keep that sense of the original spirit, or that pioneering spirit when we started of, um, of keeping it open and keeping it um, an opportunity, along with the idea of trying to systemize it so that um, ideas can be taken, looked at properly, um, resourced and, uh, and investigated. So that's the sort of story of, of, of how we um, of how we started and how we got into developing this innovation system, innovation culture, innovation team at Older Hay. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Emma Hughes. I'm the Deputy Director of Innovation. I'm going to talk to you today about a little bit about the history of Older Hay but also how we've progressed our innovation strategy. So, Alder Hay, as you know, is a, a globally renowned child, specialist children's hospital. It's inspired by children and our plan is making it a better place, a healthier future for children and young people. We're world leading in cardiac, neurology and respiratory, and we've got a long history of world firsts. We are well known for our innovation and our research heritage. We've come from an old workhouse in 1914 to now having this iconic digital hospital. And again, innovation and research has been in the blood of Older Hay. And now we have a dedicated innovation centre and research institute and treating over 300,000 patients per annum. I'd say our innovation activities started over five years ago within the, that innovation centre. And we've got a really well established, lively and productive innovation centre and activities. We're engaged with staff, working on their problems and ideas and working with the children and young people, securing that healthier future for them. One of the challenges of our innovation activities is the number of fantastic projects that we could be working on. And that's one of the things we needed to really look at prioritising. So we spent the last six months looking at our strategy, trying to understand how that fits to the trust priorities and ensuring that innovation becomes embedded um, as part of the trust strategy and within the divisions themselves. So one of the things we've been working on, as I said, is around what is our mission statement. What is the thing we wanted to achieve as an innovation centre within Older Hay? So our innovation dream, today's child, tomorrow's healthier adult. Our dream is we dare to use innovation to achieve the dream by becoming the world's most advanced healthcare innovation system. We're, we're going to do this by harnessing emerging technologies, ensuring that all our children and young people are safe, well, and grow up to be healthier adults. We want to have global impact challenge the present as it is and set the standards globally. So with that vision set, we wanted to look at how do we achieve that? We felt very strongly that our mission is to provide equitable access to older hay care and expertise, wherever our children and young people are located. We want to be co-located with the clinical services and our innovation team to be embedded with what's going on in the real world on the healthcare challenges. 
So we want to utilise emerging technologies providing that synergistic healthcare innovation ecosystem, advancing safety, ensuring access to care to ensure that healthier future for children and young people. So utilising open innovation, working with industry partners and co-creating the best solutions. So we we'll bring leading edge digital sensors, big data, AI, immersive health to enable that equitable access for our children and young people, but also expanding the reach in terms of education on future um, clinicians. We want to create a model of care that is scalable nationally and globally. So with our mission and vision uh, in place, we really also need to look at operationally how we structure our innovation centre to grow from where it is today. As I said, we've got a fantastic a number of activities ongoing, but to really build that innovation centre to reach those children on a global basis, we need to look at our operational structure. So recently we have now um, executive lead um, on, the, on the board for innovation. I'm the deputy running the day to day with the team where we have our innovation consultants and commercial teams, as well as our AI and, and business intelligence group. And we also are very clinically led with our co-founders, um, clinical directors in Hennessy and Rafael Guerrero. As I said before, we've got a great innovation centre where, where Innovation Hub was actually founded in 2014 and it's bedded in the hospital here as a thousand square metres of co-create space. And what we bring together, industry, academia and our staff to really co-create the solutions of the future. We've brought in a best in class of open innovation methodology and system. We've got a rapid prototyping centre. Um, we're building our AI HQ and a user experience lab. And then we have a real multidiscipline team um, of experts from clinical, uh, nursing, research, as well as our commercial and innovation technology scouts. As I said, in addition to building those teams, it's really looking at what are the foundations for a long-term innovation strategy. And there's four things we believe are very important. A culture, the resources, having a process, and also being sustainable. So growing a culture, we have a very active engagement uh, program where we really show the benefits of innovating to our staff and children and young people, daring them to come up with the new ideas and to innovate. And we're also looking at making sure that our innovation is embedded in the strategy of the trust, in the divisions, in the departments, and most importantly, allowing our staff to truly innovate and co-create and be rewarded and incentivized to do so. Second element that's really important is ensuring you've got the right resources. It requires investment financially uh, as well as in terms of um, people and skill sets. We have a multidisciplinary capability, as I mentioned earlier, and it's really important to have that diverse skill set within innovation department. And also the space, you need an innovative space for people to think creatively and co-create and come up with those new ideas and solutions. But also it's really important once you open those doors to innovation, you have a process where you can bring in those ideas from staff and children. And we adopted an open innovation methodology where we are collecting the needs. We're very driven by the problems in the real world. We are looking at the challenges faced day to day and then matching those with those fantastic emerging technical solutions out there and co-creating with those industry partners. So we have a pipeline process that we work through, we validate those problems, we validate those solutions, and we wrap around that with the required intellectual property and legal um, paperwork that's, that's needed. For us to continue and to grow this, we have to be sustainable. So we are very sharply commercially focused on, on many of these problems in terms of how we might take them also out to market. As I said, our focus is about the care and improving health for our children and young people. And that's our number one goal, it's impact to care. However, money isn't a dirty word. You know, for us to be sustainable, there's no reason why we shouldn't also make money because the money we make on any of these innovations is fed back into the hospital. So we look at how we set up our partnerships and our co-creation approach to with bear in mind the potential then for commercialization bringing much better value and return on investment for the hospital in terms of innovation. Another really important factor in that in terms of being sustainable is growing our brand and having um, a real position 
nationally and internationally, and that's something we are very keen on developing further. Just to recap, innovation's here to stay in Alder Hay. We're building a really exciting, sustainable activity. Um, we're setting the foundations over the last few years around creating that really daring to innovate culture rewarding incentivizes our staff. We're driven on the real problems and solving those real problems they face every day. We brought in multidisciplinary teams and finances and resources, and we really got a robust process to be able to prioritize and filter the things we work on. And finally, to also then look at the commercial opportunities and create the business models around those opportunities. Thank you. Hello, lovely to be here today to present on making innovation make sense to hospital executives. Um, my name's Claire Liddy, I'm the Managing Director of Innovation at Alder Hay Children's Hospital over in Liverpool in the United Kingdom. In today's presentation, I'm gonna take you through a few things from my personal perspective around how to make um, a world-class innovation center work. First of all, I'm gonna reflect on my journey um, and how it can feel a bit like a roller coaster. And then I'm going to take you through what I think are the secret ingredients to making a global innovation centre work. And then I'm going to wrap up and summarise and happy to take any questions from the chat. So first of all, to introduce ourselves, um, we're a specialist children's hospital over in Liverpool. We were actually built and designed and inspired by children and young people, which makes us a wonderfully special place. Um, and it's a place of true innovation. We've got lots of world firsts and we've, we've been leading the way with innovation for over five years now. We've got a really strong research heritage, but what I'm gonna talk you through today is very much the journey we went on, which started over six years ago, um, to get us where we are right here, right now, today. So here we are today, and um, we're really proud to be able to showcase and tell our story. We have an established, lively, productive, and world-class innovation center. However, to get to this point, it took us over six years and it felt like a roller coaster to get there. When we very first started, the Innovation Centre was just a room in our old hospital in a Victorian building. But now we have a dedicated facility. It's over a thousand metres squared, co-creation space, rapid prototyping, um, and a team of over 14 dedicated innovation consultants who help the hospital make innovation happen. We're really proud to be here today um, to tell you how it felt um, and my big thing today is going to be to tell you how you get executives on board with making an innovation centre in a hospital. So moving on to the roller coaster, that's my analogy of how it felt. So I'm going to tell you a personal story actually. Um, I've not been the managing director for innovation for the whole of them um, six years. I actually started in a different carriage on that roller coaster. I used to be the deputy director of finance at Alder Hay. So for four years, of them six years, I was in a different carriage and I certainly wasn't in with the innovation team. And back then, it felt really different. Um, I was definitely oil and the innovation team were definitely water and the two didn't mix. So it felt really, really tricky because we knew that strategically Alder Hay wanted to be this global centre for innovation. It was on our strategic plan. It was in our board objectives. But actually trying to find that missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle was really difficult. Me sat there in finance with my calculator counting all them beans. I just couldn't quite figure out or fathom out why we should be investing in innovation. It didn't make sense to me at all. And for a while, the innovation centre really felt a bit rogue. Um, they felt like they were going off on off piste. It felt like they were um, needing to beg, borrow and steal. Um, and the board and the executive team and even the finance department started to get a bit impatient. So what happened on that roller coaster ride? We had the Innovation Centre core team, which was actually only um, two people when it started, but it had a really strong clinical lead who made sure that that roller coaster kept going and they kept building the bridge and building them double dips as they went. So moving on then to how did we make it happen? How did we move away from feeling like we were on the roller coaster? I call it the secret ingredients. So what I'm going to talk you through now is the textbook answer to how you make innovation centres work. 
So in our opinion, there's four key ingredients to a successful innovation centre. And this isn't something that Alder Hay, you know, has, has, has made. This is actually, you know, what would be in a textbook. But for Alder Hay, actually, even though we knew all of this and we had that intelligence, our innovation centre was getting to a point where it hit almost a brick wall. It got to the best it could be, but it wasn't going to the next level. So what actually happened was when I was sat in my finance department um, working on my month end results, is the chief exec said to me, actually, what we'd really like to do, Claire, is for you to go in and to do a, um, a reset process to take innovation at Alder Hay to the next level. So when I did that, I wasn't sure, because as I say, I was really unsure actually whether I believed in and whether I had faith that innovation could really be successful in the NHS. But I did it. Um, and the minute I started to work with the innovation team, my eyes were um, wide open. I was inspired. And from day one, I was absolutely caught in that innovation trap. And what I did during that reset process is really think in an older hay way and in our way, something that was meaningful to us, how we were going to kind of enhance what we already had to take us to that level, to be the global innovation centre that we need. So the four things that we actually did, and it did actually in hindsight follow the, the rule book, but we didn't know it at the time, is we worked really hard on embedding innovation in the culture at Alder Hay. So I worked really hard as part of the executive team on linking our innovation strategy to be hand in hand, hand in glove, some people say, with our core hospital strategy. So it didn't feel like it was something going on on the side of a desk or a third wheel. So that was a big piece about embedding and including innovation as part of the core. The second thing that I did with the help of my team is we really looked at what we needed in terms of key resources, key capabilities, and we had a strategy to expand the team. And we made the team really multidisciplinary with a real wide variety of skills. Any innovation centre needs a variety of skills and not just one particular skill set, and that's what we've done. And I'm really proud to stand here today that now we've got 14 um, members of the team who are great talent. The next thing we did was spent a long time actually moving away from a randomised approach to innovation where it was whoever shouted loudest got you know the attention or got the, the money that we had to put in a process um, and we put in a healthcare specific open innovation pipeline and process which has been really really successful and we're still using that today. The final thing that was really important in that reset was finding out how we were going to be pitching to the board that we would be sustainable and that the board should invest in innovation now because we bring sustainability in the future. And that's where probably my skills and my, um, my approach really came into play because I understood the money. I understood how the NHS would invest to save and how return on investments would work. So I played a key role in bringing that more commercial focus to the team, but also being able to describe to the board why we should invest now to make savings and to make benefit and make impact in the future. So the next thing we did was we really wanted to get innovation, you know, its own identity and brand at Alder Hay. And I think we've always been really proud at Alder Hay that we don't just want to be standard NHS. So I wanted to share with you today our new strategy, our elevator pitch. I'm really delighted and excited that we've called our new strategy Daring to Innovate because it really epitomises who we are and what we're about. In Alder Hay, we want to be brave, we want to be different and we want to be able to move at pace. So our new strategy is all about daring to innovate. When we thought about the why, the so what, why do we want to innovate? What we've landed on as our strapline is today's child, tomorrow's healthier adult. What means a lot for Alder Hay and for us in the team is that if we can impact children now, 30% um, of our population are kids, but they'll be 100% of the future. So our big goal is to have an impact for every child and have innovations that touch every child on the planet or 1.9 million of them. And if we can do that, that's when we'll get the champagne glasses out. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the executive hook, um, which was really important to us. If I'm really honest, when I look back on that roller coaster, especially when I was sat with my finance um, boots on, um, we were very much considering innovation to be a commercial activity, something that was going to help the bottom line, something that was going to bring revenues into Alder Hay. Um, and it might do, but actually what we were missing was that hook. And I think what we've redone now and reset is our main hook, our main focus is about having impact to care. We're really clear now that our strategy, our innovation strategy delivers this trust strategy. And our trust strategy is to have 
um, the best, most outstanding quality care for children and young people. So I just wanted to share today, you know, one of our impact stories that we're really proud of. And um, this was a, you know, a girl um, with with a cancer, um, a really rare cancer actually. I don't think a cancer that's even got a name because it was so rare. But we used our innovations, um, specifically our three D printing, to really help with that preoperative planning to make that really dangerous, complicated surgery successful. Um, and now that little girl, you know, she's back at school and that's what it's all about. It's about having that impact to care. The final thing I wanted to share with you today is just my advice for my journey, you know, my personal journey, um, moving across from a finance, a business role into an innovation role. I'm not sure it's a career path I would have thought of five years ago, but it's where I am and it's, you know, I'm delighted about it. But my four pieces of advice really from that journey, which I'd like to share with you, which might give you a shortcut, it might give you a way of doing it quicker, it might give you a way of doing it better than older hay and getting there faster than us, um, are as follows. The first one I think is really important, that innovation and setting up an innovation centre from scratch can be a roller coaster, but that's okay, <laughs> you know, that's what it's like, it's hard, if it was easy everyone would have done it and everyone would have successful innovation centres in hospitals in the world. So hold your nerve. If you've got a goal and you've got a big vision and you know you're on the right track, hold your nerve. You will get challenged. You will get folk not believing in you. You'll get folk thinking you're rogue, but that's okay. Hold your nerve. Keep on track, keep going, and you'll get there in the end. The second thing I wanted to talk about was that credibility point. I think one of the challenges for an innovation centre when you're trying out stuff which is um, not the norm, which isn't the standard, which can feel quirky, it can feel different and it can feel definitely disruptive, is you need to do that in a credible way so that you've got the respect of both your colleagues but also your board, that they will know that what you're doing is going to have long-term benefit for you know short-term effort. So that credibility is really critical. And one of the key ingredients for credibility is having the right team. Um, and I would just really recommend that any new innovation centres that get going, make sure you've got that right team. Make sure you've got a team with the, the right talent. You need commercial people with IP experience. You need clinical inspiration. You'll need um, folk with financial skills, but you'll also need tech startup skills and, and, and probably a plethora of other things. But my key advice is making sure you've got that credible team is, is a key and has really helped us at Older Hay do what we've done. The third piece of advice for me, and this is probably critical actually, and I would say probably the number one piece of advice that I could give any innovation centre, is be really clear with the board when they invest around what they're going to get in return. Set them expectations from the start. Don't enter into you know a deal with board that you're going to give you money in year one, and then in year two there's going to be upside or return on investment. Innovation is not necessarily for everybody a quick win. You can get some quick wins and some early wins and that's fantastic. But most times if you're really, really honest about doing open innovation and product development, you are talking potentially a five to 10 year sustainability runway. So be really clear with the board because actually if you set up on the wrong foot and you say, right, we're gonna make money in year one and there's gonna be a commercial and there's gonna be this and there's gonna be that, and it's gonna be all fantastic. Very quickly, the KPIs won't look good and there won't be a positive buzz and actually that's not going to help with the innovation culture that you need to set. The final piece of advice is about that impact. Be really clear from the outset in your innovation strategy around the so what. What is the impact you want to have? You know, and I think for most hospitals who are in the business of delivering care, it's really obvious you want to have impact to care. But say it, believe it, report on it, count it. Have their metrics that demonstrate the benefit that you're having to patients. Tell the story through patient stories, real life stories for others to see, for others to hear and for them people to think that's fantastic. We want more of that. We're going to grow that. That's brilliant. So that's it for me today. That's my final slide. So I'd just like to wrap up with three key points from the presentation today. The first one is find your hook with your board, something that means um, a lot to them and something that they'll buy into. The second one is get the right people on board, the right team and the right capabilities and we're all working to the same common goal. And the final one, this is an older hay one, but be brave and be different. If you want to be a great innovation centre, find your USP, feel like you're different, feel like you're brave. So that's it for me today. Really delighted to talk you through our journey and happy if there's any additional questions um, to take them in the chat.
Thank you. Hi everybody, it's great to be with you today. Um, so my name is Kate Warriner. I'm the Chief Digital and Information Officer at Alder High. Um, I'm also the Chief Digital and Information Officer at Liverpool Heart and Chest, but today we're going to share with you Alder High's journey to a digital future. So there's just a few things I really wanted to share. Um, so I think the first point I would make really is for Alder High, digital has been identified as a major priority for the organisation. Um, it's a strategic priority identified through our plan, which is the trust strategy. And we have a, a great legacy of um, prioritising digital, uh, including investment um, back by our board and also supported by our clinical divisions. Our digital future is built on absolutely solid foundations. Um, as I've mentioned really, we've got this history of prioritisation and investment. We've got great people. We've got fantastic clinicians. Um, we have an electronic patient records, which has been in place for a number of years, um, which really helps us throughout the organisation in terms of our, our, our digital work. Um, we were delighted to be part of the Global Digital Exemplar Programme um, and, you know, internally, you know, we, we've invested greatly in our digital work through the years. Um, our work on the new hospital and um, digital was, was baked throughout that um, and was, was really fantastic in, in terms of looking to, to what the opportunities are in delivering care. We did a piece of work back in 2019 um, with our staff and our children and young people really to, to reflect on where we were up to and the strong foundations that we had in place, but also looking to the future and seeing, you know, wh where is it that we want to go in the future and what are our aspirations around digital? Um, the children and young people, the, the, the children and young people's forum kept us on our toes and said things like, you know, why do you send us paper and um, stop sending us paper? Um, and also, you know, sometimes it can be frightening for us to come in to hospital. So we'd like to see some of the things that uh, are in place before we come in. So we'd like to meet the staff before we come in and also things, you know, more, more innovative things around for using virtual and augmented reality and um, when having procedures to, to distract them from, from frightening procedures. We set out a very clear vision for digital futures and this was really around thinking about digital excellence and outstanding digital excellence but at the heart of this was, was a, a, an ambition around creating the really best experience for our staff and for our children, young people and their families. And through this, um, we really set out an aspiration to strive to deliver the, the best digital and technology services for our staff, um, enabling excellent clinical care and excellent clinical outcomes. We set out a commitment to deliver the basics well um, and championing a digital first approach within Alder High. We also said, you know, we were keen to unleash innovation and research and um, that there's a real um, close connection between innovation, research and digital, with digital enabling lots of really great opportunities for innovation and research. And we also set out um, an aspiration and a commitment to maximise local, national and international partnerships in that work. So through our Digital Futures approach, we set out three key themes um, back in 2019. So the first was around interacting differently with our children, young people and their families. And we set out a, a range of programmes around that. So things including um, the development of a digital front door to be able to connect with Alder Hay, um, including our website, our, our intranet for staff, but in a really exciting way, you know, enabling um, our children, and young people to see our clinicians digitally um, and for the removal of paper, which is one of the things which the Children and Young People's Forum has asked for and a range of other things in terms of connecting differently with our children and young people. We also set out a key theme in terms of digital quality improvement, and this was building on the way that we had in place with our electronic patient records. We now, um, that good, safe organisations and high quality care where we have good digital systems and good digital processes can really enhance that high level of quality and high level of safety. So we set out a suite of programmes working with our clinical teams um, in, in that regard. We also gave a huge commitment to our clinical divisions um, in terms of making sure that they had the right equipment to do what they needed and our clinical staff needed to care for the children and young people that they were looking after.
And our final theme really with three key themes was, was around really unleashing innovation and research. As I mentioned earlier, really ensuring that there was that close alignment between digital innovation and, and research and maximising those opportunities. We felt that what we needed to do to achieve these three themes was to get a number of things right. And that started with the basics. Um, and so we had a refreshed technology roadmap, which included a, a real range of things from upgrading some of our equipment on our boards to upgrading some of our back end infrastructure um, and, and a really great range of things which we put in place throughout 2019. So, in terms of some of our headline achievements, um, what I wanted to do was just, just talk through some of those. So the first, you know, we've talked about getting the basics right. One of the, the key things which we found was fantastic for us was our move over to Office 365. And we never knew how much we were actually going to benefit from that in terms of our support for our COVID response. Um, and I think it's true to say, you know, the, the way that we've done in terms of 365 and particularly Microsoft Teams um, has enabled us to continue continue to care for our children and young people and to keep them safe and to keep our staff safe through the COVID pandemic. We have improved our core infrastructure, um, but we have um, invested heavily in, in really improving the equipment that our staff use day to day. Um, we've um, given out laptop devices, mobile devices, and we've, we've upgraded some of the mobile applications and, and equipment that are in place across our wards and our community services. We were delighted um, this year actually to, to receive accreditation for our Global Digital Exemplar programme and this was around really upping the game and upping the ante on our digitisation of our clinical work across the organisation but also doing some really exciting stuff um, including championing the Older Play app and, and championing our uh, wider system approach to information sharing through the Share to Care programme. That led um, to a incredible achievement where we were highlighted as the um, one of the first trusts actually in the country um, to achieve HIMS level six accreditation in December last year. And HIMS level six, for those that don't know what HIMS is, so HIMS is an international benchmark for digital maturity. And this is very much around um, how well technology is used um, throughout care processes and organisations. It's a fairly new thing to the UK, um, but is well used globally across the world. Um, it goes from level zero to level seven level seven being the most digitally mature organisations and level zero being the most digitally immature. So our aspiration is to build on our level six work and, and take us to, to level seven next year. I've touched on the COVID response um, and I think it's fair to say without our work on digital futures we would not have been able to respond as we have done to the COVID pandemic um, and the crisis that we've seen across the world but you know locally um, and our, our staff and our children in, in Alder Hay and um, this has really helped us to keep everybody safe but it's also helped us to keep connected which has been a really important thing um, for all of us throughout the pandemic and, and it has helped Alder Hay to continue to care for the children and young people um, that we are here to serve every day. And um, so we're really proud of our digital achievements in, in that area. And um, one of the things which we did set out through Digital Futures was this interacting differently with children and young people. And one of the things which we have really accelerated through the pandemic is our approach to digital, digital consultations. Um, and reflecting on that, I think you know, there was a number of us having various workshops pre the pandemic, physically all in a room together. Um, but really working on those plans and actually, you know, COVID just gave us a, a platform um, and a, an opportunity to, to do something very different at scale. Um, COVID also helped us really in our thinking around telemedicine. And again, you know, this had been something that our innovation team had been looking at with um, the Neonatal Partnership. Um, and we actually had a session with them. Um, with the Mayo Clinic just before the uh, lockdown in March um, and we took some very quick early decisions um, with our innovation and digital and our, our neonatal partnership to invest in, in telemedicine and to support the service to, to provide some fabulous Look, looking after the, the smallest, sickest babies in our city um, and that telemedicine work has been absolutely fantastic in as part of our COVID response and it continues. 
just with some feedback from our patients um so so you know this is this is fantastic i think it was what our children young people asked for and um, when we launched our digital futures work and and they actually named our, our work digital futures um, but you know they're really grateful for what we've managed to do for them and i think particularly around interacting with them through video um, you know they, they don't have to struggle getting a car parking space um, and, and they've really um, embraced this new way of working and, and long may it continue into the future where it's appropriate to do so. So just final part of the presentation really is, is just some reflections on some of our, our key ingredients and this is perhaps a little bit more of a fun part of the, the presentation. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, the Children and Young People's Forum um, and these, I must caveat, these pictures were taken in 2019. So uh, there is no social distancing, but that wasn't a thing in 2019. And the pictures you see there um, is the, the engagement or some of the engagement we did with, with our forum um, in Digital Futures. I, I had a brilliant grilling from them and we, we did a video with them um, and they were instrumental in our Digital Futures plans. Um, they also helped with um, with judging some awards with our digital team and, and brought some great spirit and, and fun to that environment. I think the second ingredient for success I just wanted to reflect on um, was great clinical leadership and work with our division. So we've got three um, clinical divisions in Alder Hay, which is our medicine division, our surgical division and community and mental health. And what you see on the screen in there are, are three of our fabulous clinical leaders so they're what we call our ccio so our chief clinical information officers and we've got one per division and they're really the voice of digital out and about on the ground gathering views from their colleagues but really keeping us on our toes and, and leading us in, in this really important agenda the next thing really is is just celebrating the what a great team we've got and we've built up a fabulous team really talented individuals and I think that having the right people around this work, leading it and delivering it on the ground is absolutely critical um, to, to the success we've seen in Alder High. Um, again, what you see there is a picture that was taken in December 2019. Um, and you can see, you can just see on the top um, is, is a big balloon of a number six. And that was us celebrating our HIMSS Level 6 accreditation. But it was also um, a really poignant moment for those of us in Liverpool that are Liverpool fans. Um, and we had the football team in. Um, celebrating six their major significant cup win for, for Liverpool um, and again you know no social distancing there because it was it was pre-COVID but it was it was a great celebration event for the team. I think just just moving on really I think the next thing is is around building on the team I think having the right support in place and having the right attitude and the right culture and that takes time to, to build that and for someone like me who's, who's quite impatient actually and um, you know that there's something around being being patient to, to see that really materialize and I think our learning through COVID and how we've approached the COVID, COVID pandemic from a digital team perspective has really cemented this um, thing together and um, what you see on the screen there is, is a number of things and um, one of the things um which we set up very early in the pandemic was a high five board in our department and this was in recognition of our fabulous staff who were working round the clock um to, to put in place things for our, our clinical teams and, and our corporate teams um, and so this high five board is something which was reviewed on our daily calls at that point um, in our department, unfortunately, we, we lost one of our team to COVID, which was a tragic experience. Um, and one of the things we were keen to do was to regularly remember Andy, our colleague, um, and the team actually renamed our high five board to Stampy's high five board in his memory. Um, we now continue those team sessions twice a week and, and we, we celebrate you know, the, the successes of, of our staff and we hear from our teams and, and we talk about Andy's Stampy's high five board and, and we, um, we celebrate successes twice a week. And that's been a big cultural improvement, I think, for, for the, the way we, we do things. Um, one of the things we also put in place was a drop-in clinic and this is um, quite novel I think in um, in some digital services and it was something we were keen to do actually through Digital Futures thinking about the the, the genius bar type concept where you can walk in and be greeted with a smile and be able to get your, your issue fixed 
and we put that in place for our staff through COVID and we've kept that in place. So it, it's really appreciated by our clinical teams and it's a huge success um, in terms of the way we deliver our services. And then my, my final um, ingredient for success, and again, this, this links to the twice weekly sessions we have in our department, but I think it permeates out. There's something around just remembering to have a bit of fun. Um, so we did a range of things um, at our, our briefings. Um, so we have pet of the day, so you can see someone's pet of the day there on the, on the screen. And one of our staff actually dressed up as a unicorn um, with, with, with his two dogs. Um, we had a great bake off and what, what you can see on the left there is um is a cake which one of our, our team members baked. Um that cake was actually baked on the back of a picture which one of our staff members um children had made for, for our team and it says have a great day, NHS heroes, and it really lifted everyone's spirits during the pandemic. Um, and then the other pictures you can see, so there's one in the background and then there's one at the front and, and these are our regular briefings. So, so the one on the top really has got when masks were introduced, I was actually working at home that day, but one of the team there's got a mask and he's put a smile on his mask. And so that was, you know, to keep us all going. And then the one in the background, this was our Halloween theme day and I was actually, um, encouraged to dress up so i'll leave you to spot where i am on that uh, but we had great fun in um in really just keeping together um, and creating that you know great culture keeping going and keeping everyone motivated and um, with real passion and energy that's our in a nutshell really and a bit of a whistle stop tour um where we are from an older hey digital futures perspective um we are so proud of what we've delivered. It makes a great difference to staff and it's a real privilege to share that with you today. Thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Rebecca Hamilton Cook and I'm the Commercial Research Business Development Manager here in the Clinical Research Division at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. In response to our commercial partners, we have recently established a new commercial team called CORE, which is challenging the way that we work with and for our commercial partners to bring new solutions and medicines that meet the unmet needs and benefit our babies, children and young people. As a centre with rich heritage in research and development, including the successful delivery of clinical studies, we are used to working in partnership with our children and young people, and in fact, see their input fundamental to our success. We have experienced clinical and academic researchers across our 45 specialities, including outstanding facilities and a dedicated research facility, which is funded by the National Institute of Health Research. This facility, which is dedicated to early phase experimental medicine, has been successful in supporting a range of studies and has clinical leadership in several themes. These themes include infection, oncology and metabolic conditions. Complementary to this, we have experience and clinical leadership in medicines formulation and the development and delivery of device studies. CORE brings that combination of clinical expertise excellence in delivery and experience of working with the paediatric population together to support companies in achieving their goals. So how can we help? We offer a range of services that can support companies in navigating the clinical trial landscape. From understanding what is acceptable to our patients, gaining feedback on prototypes and products, to working with our clinicians to understand the unmet need, we can provide you with guidance to choose the best research-based methods to produce high quality data and outcomes. So even if you've never done clinical research before, or are even sh not sure whether you should, we want to make this choice easier for you. We work with a range of businesses, from SMEs to large multinationals across a variety of healthcare markets, including therapeutics, diagnostics, genomics and medical devices. We offer a range of services, including early project design, rapid feasibility, protocol writing, excellent recruitment to trials, high quality data collection and analysis, supporting regulatory submissions and grant writing for collaborative ventures. So if you'd like to know more about working with us, understanding the benefits that clinical research can offer your business, then please get in touch with me and we look forward to working with you.
Hello, my name is Steve Begley. I'm Head of Procurement at Alder Hay Children's Hospital. Uh, I'd just like to give a short presentation on the way innovation and procurement have worked together at Alder Hay. So, looking at the contents that we'll be uh, talking about today, uh, as you can see, there'll be an introduction of what this is all about. Then there'll be a discussion around the barriers to the new entrance to NHS markets, uh, the COVID-19 response that we uh, had to address this year, I'll talk about intellectual property rights and possible gain shares with suppliers and about an innovation dynamic purchasing system that the Trust has actually uh, produced and then I'll summarise at the end. So if uh, I can just start. So um, historically uh, the NHS uh, procurement teams have not really been involved in innovation uh, and product development. They've tended just to focus on things like making savings and uh, reducing costs by negotiating lower prices for what we buy. Um, but more recently I think some more progressive trusts have actually uh, embraced innovation and they've explored ways in which they can co-create products which are innovative and unique and Alder Hay is one such trust. So, in order to successfully navigate the minefield of procurement law and ensuring value for money obligations are met in respect to public sector expenditure, um, early engagement with trust procurement teams are key to that. All trusts have certain rules that they have to um, comply with and, you know, and they have financial governance rules, uh, often known as standing financial instructions or SFIs for short. We also have to comply with things like European procurement directives and there are other statutory provisions as well on top of that. Um, when we deal with suppliers, we uh, try to contract on our terms and conditions, so the standard NHS terms whenever possible. Uh, and then we also have to make sure that uh, necessary budgets are in place to actually purchase goods. One of the key overriding factors for all of this is ensuring that best value for money is obtained uh, when you're spending public money. Okay, so uh, often suppliers, particularly small companies and innovative uh, startups and entrepreneurs, often find it difficult to access NHS markets. Uh, they often come up against barriers, um, which I have, have tried to set out in this presentation. One of the, the big ones is about the lack of awareness of um, companies who don't deal with the NHS normally around the rules that apply to uh, the way that you have to deal with the NHS. Another issue might be around not having a checkable track record because that's important to the NHS that we're able to check the credentials and check the, the history of a company who we are planning to deal with. And then there are other issues around innovative products and suppliers are often unfavorably compared against the sort of established safe option suppliers who have been around for years. Uh, and that's a difficult hurdle for new companies to try and, uh, uh, try and get over. Uh, most trusts also within the NHS are, are very nervous about being a guinea pig. You know, they don't want to be the first trust and they often won't be an early adopter. They'd rather see how it goes and then they'll adopt as it's a more mature product that's established across the NHS. So that can often be a difficult thing for new companies to actually get into the NHS markets because no one is prepared to take that step and give them the first order. Um, I mentioned the rules before. I think one of the main things about the rules is um, there are certain things that have to be adhered to. So there are thresholds around uh, compliance uh, with European procurement law. Uh, so spending money over a certain threshold requires um, competitive processes. There are also issues around making sure that there are budgets for purchases because one of an example that I can quote is that when a supplier approaches a trust who wants to sell their product, um, they often are quite frustrated when we have to reply to them by saying, well, unfortunately, there's no budget for that, or there needs to be a business case created, or we already have a contract with a competitor. Uh, and as I say, if it's above a certain value, then there's a, a, a need for us to do a formal competitive tendering exercise so we can't just award business necessarily to one company who happens to approach us. This can create disappointment and frustration for uh, companies, especially those who haven't dealt with the NHS before, as they really struggle to see why they can't just sell their product to us. Okay, so I think this year has been the most challenging year for NHS procurement ever, I would say, certainly in the 20 years that I've worked at Alder Hay. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic obviously has changed everything, and certainly for procurement people, 
it has been a real struggle for us to make sure that we have the, the personal protective equipment to actually ensure that our patients and staff are kept safe. So at the height of this pandemic, um, all trusts were being inundated with approaches from suppliers of PPE of varying levels of quality and prices. This was very difficult for us to sort out the good from the bad, uh, and all trusts were spending a lot of time trying to get their heads around that. Consequently, Alder Hay created an innovation portal so we were able to coordinate these numerous supplier approaches across the Cheshire and Merseyside region. So we took it on ourselves on, on behalf of our region to actually coordinate these approaches that the suppliers were making so each trust wasn't have to deal with them individually. Uh, and basically that has been very successful and has really helped to sort out the genuine approaches from the ones which weren't worth pursuing. Old Hayes uh, innovation and procurement teams also work with suppliers and other partners as well to actually develop new products during this time and this was in direct response to the fact that we didn't have the product we needed and it was a real critical issue for us to make sure that we didn't let our staff and patients be exposed to risk. So some of the products that we developed with innovation team and procurement team combined were uh, visors as at, at the start of this, there was a massive requirement for visors and there wasn't any supply out there. So we worked with a supplier to actually bring a product to market um, within a few weeks from just developing the concept to actually getting the physical product created. And that was something our clinical director of innovation led on. Uh, we also were working with a company on mask saver boxes. So this was to prolong the life of the FFP3 masks, which were also in very short supply. And we also work with a local cotton mill on uh, cotton face coverings as well, which have now been issued to all staff in the trust. And we also sell those in our charity uh, on our charity website. So during uh, the, the uh, height of the pandemic, the main focus for us was on reducing the, um, the, the reliance on supplies from the Far East because um, no local suppliers were supplying what we needed and it was all about Far East and particularly China where we were having to source product from which clearly wasn't sustainable and, and re really put us in a, in a bad position. So we have been pursuing a made in Britain approach wherever possible and we also now have been able to gain more control around the costs by uh, not, be, not being reliant on the Far East markets because at the time, at the, at the very worst, we were looking at 10 times the price of the pre-COVID uh, prices. So, um, talking about intellectual property rights and gain share now, as I say, Alder Hay is leading in working with suppliers on innovative products and creating and co-creating products with suppliers. Um, in the past, there's been, uh, NHS has dealt a lot with suppliers, but have tended to provide input without really getting anything in return. So they've used us as a sounding board and a test bed and our clinicians have often given them some very good information on how their product could be improved. Um, we are now seeing this, that it's an opportunity that we should be recognized for the input that we make. So Alderhey now works on the basis of co-creating products where it's applicable to solve the clinical problems that we have. Uh, and we are also exploring commercial opportunities with these companies as well so that it, our contribution can actually be recognized um, and monetized as well. So some of the things that we have looked at are sharing the intellectual property of the products that are created. So not just the supplier owning the intellectual property, but the trust would also have a share in that. Obtaining royalties or the financial rewards based on sales to other um, customers, if you like, apart from ourselves or and or favorable pricing uh, for the sales that are made to our trust, which would be better than what other customers would benefit from. An innovation dynamic purchasing system uh, may not be familiar to a lot of people, but this is basically um, a purchasing arrangement that the trust has put in place. And this was in direct response to the way that uh, we are working with suppliers and then once we create a product or once there is a, an opportunity to supply to the NHS, actually access, accessing the NHS markets is very difficult for the reasons I've mentioned earlier. So one of the things that we actually uh, did was we created a dynamic purchasing system which is a, a very flexible uh, competitive tendering process which remains open rather than the, the closed processes that most trusts operate. This enables new entrants to the market to quickly be able to obtain 
a compliant procurement route into the NHS. So Alder has created this framework which lasts for four years and it started early this year. It, the framework is split into three lots, so it's medical consumables, medical equipment and also IT related products such as apps and software. So Alder Hay will receive a royalty for uh, some of the income that is derived by using this framework and that again is something that we feel that commercialising things like this is a very innovative thing to do and, and a very valuable thing for the trust to be involved in. Um, there's a very strict definition of innovation within this uh, dynamic purchasing system because this is about truly unique and innovative products. It's not just about products that have been established and on the market for you know, a long time. This, these are truly new innovative products that we are looking to procure and to encourage small businesses, entrepreneurs and startups to actually get involved with. So in summary, uh, what I would say is that we all know that the, for many years the NHS has been under financial stress and there are many trusts who have reported large budget deficits and probably will continue to do so. We also know the demand on the healthcare system is growing year by year. And the NHS does value its suppliers and the goods and services they supply. And also we appreciate the need for suppliers to make profits as well. We need to work closely with our suppliers and deliver the highest level of patient care at the best possible value. That's something every trust will tell you. And one of the things that has come uh, really to the forefront over the last few months is the need to innovate has never been stronger. So with the very uncertain future around the, the pandemic, plus the financial strain the NHS has already been under, it's vital that we have new novel ways of solving clinical problems. And this should be at the forefront of the NHS agenda going forward. The close relationship between all the Hay innovation and procurement teams has been a real key benefit derived from the COVID-19 experience. It's not something that we thought would happen, but it just was something that when, when the pandemic hit, it made sense for us to work together. And we have really created a, a close bond and relationship, which I'm sure will continue going forward. And in summary, I suppose the Alder Hay procurement team is always eager to listen and engage with suppliers and anything that um, suppliers would like to talk to us about improving patient care, reducing costs and promoting innovation is something we would welcome. I'd like to thank you for listening to me and thank you all. Hi, I'm Hayley Thomas and I'm the Head of Corporate Fundraising at Alder Hay Children's Charity. As a charity, we're here to support the hospital with enhancements above and beyond what the NHS would normally provide. We fund four broad areas across the hospital. These are life-saving medical equipment, campus, innovation and research, and what we call the magic. The magic can be anything from 4D projection, which transforms treatment rooms, to the amazing music and art therapy programmes we have here at Alder Hay. But today I'll work with the innovation team at the hospital. A visit to the Innovation Hub on one of our hospital tours is always a real highlight. It always captures the attention and the imagination of our supporters and they can clearly see the benefits, the potential and the impact of the projects that the teams are working on. So we work really closely with the Innovation team to understand how we can support them and we've recently funded several roles within the team. That includes innovation consultants, health entrepreneurs and a clinical innovator. The funding of these posts has allowed the team to identify and assess the needs of the hospital and conduct a review of current projects as well. So that identifies the next steps and further funding that's required for those. It's also enabled the pump priming of pipeline projects, getting them to a stage where they can look at further funding from other sources and that can be applied for and accessed as well. One of the innovation projects that has been supported with funding during COVID by the charity has been telemedicine. Alder Hay Children's and Liverpool Women's Hospitals have been using innovative telemedicine robots to ensure that babies are provided with the best care possible without the clinician being in the room. So this is really exciting because it's been done through the new telemedicine robots, which have enabled clinicians to take part in ward rounds, deliver emergency medical advice and facilitate urgent reviews for babies as well. Because of this technology, it means that clinicians are still able to make accurate clinical decisions. They can use the high definition cameras and they can plug in medical devices as well to use for that assessment. So we're really pleased that we were able to fund this project, which was especially critical during the pandemic, but will also be beneficial in the future. 
As a corporate fundraising team, we're constantly looking for corporate partners who align with our values and we work strategically to make the biggest impact. So many of the projects that the innovation team are working on currently have the potential to change healthcare practice and improve treatments which have a national and global impact. The projects are varied and we work with companies to understand what themes or areas they're interested in supporting to ensure that staff fully engage with us. And whether that's through sharing expertise, through fundraising or through gifts in kind, we work with partners in lots of different ways. So my first experience working on a project was the Older Play app. And that's a hospital app which is child friendly and helps to familiarise patients and their families with the hospital also distracting and rewarding patients um, with fun games, with stickers um, and lots of great content as well. So this was a new concept at the time and we knew that we needed support from a company who understood what we were trying to do and could see the benefits for our patients. And I was delighted when Shop Direct, which are now the very group, agreed to partner with us for a year, but they also gave us support with their expertise as well. So they themselves were on a similar journey and they'd recently created their own app and were looking at integrating AI technology as well. We were supported by an incredible team who were able to advise us based on their experience and the app developer was going to bring this to life so it needed to be the right partner. Their advice and guidance was really invaluable. We hadn't had any experience in app development before, so we really needed somebody to steer us and support us along the way. And then whilst this was happening, the staff across the organisation were looking at loads of unique fundraising ideas to help reach the £200,000 target that they'd set themselves. Staff took part, part in a walk between the sites um, in a retro gaming event and held company-wide raffles along with lots and lots of other fundraising ideas and they actually reached an amazing £250,000. This all supported the first iteration of the app and we were able to engage the staff by sharing stories from our research with the staff and patients. Lots of really great things came out of that and it was lovely to be able to share that with the staff, just keeping them updated with our app creation journey. So for us as a corporate team, it's really powerful when we're able to work in partnership with external companies. So we'd love to hear from anybody who would be interested in initial discussion um, around some of the projects that the innovation team are working on at the moment, or just anybody who wants to talk through their CSR programme and see how we can work together in the future. Please do get in touch with, with me and my team um, through corporate at alderhaycharity.org if you are interested. There's so much more to talk about and um, I haven't covered even half of it on this talk, but we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Bye bye.